terms. Okay, can you see full screen mode? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good. So we might we might still wait, maybe one minute, because I see still some people are coming, although it's almost time to start. But okay. maybe I will wait one minute just uh, to allow some more people to join, just in case, because it's it's complex, so maybe maybe I'll still wait one more minute. I think Agata is recording a meeting this time again. And Agata? Yes, yes, I am. Yes, I'm yeah. already recording, yes. I'm already recording, perfect. So how many people we have? Uh, about 20. Okay. Okay, so perhaps I will start and I would like to welcome you to second day of uh, summer school about post mining land system reclamation. And in this morning lecture, I would like to summarize kind of uh, reclamation approaches used in post mining land uh, reclamation, but it will be mostly kind of temperate view. Most of the examples here are based on a approaches used in uh, Europe, North America, or New Zealand. So it's more uh, like a temperate zone of, uh, of uh, you know, which is typically by broadleaf forest uh, as a climax. So I would really emphasize what I already mentioned yesterday, that many of the uh, items in the site preparation, you can much more effectively do during a heaping process, during the process when the soil is actually uh, prepared, when the site is actually prepared for reclamation, and it's actually, uh, it's actually usually much cheaper than when we do that as a part of reclamation. Another uh, thing I want to emphasize is that uh, this, this decision is really uh, quite strong between forest ecosystem and agricultural land because uh, we really have to emphasize more other soil properties for forest ecosystem while the other soil properties should be emphasized for uh, agricultural land. I just mentioned here a brief example, you know, in a Cologne mining region, they actually have a lot of loss resources and they use, you know, a large loss cover and they actually restored a rebel land on that, but actually to form a forest, they use a gravel, which they have other places and they mix it to loss and then they use this a uh, gravel loss mixture to grow a forest because adding gravel actually increase macroporosity, which is really beneficial for trees. On the other hand, you do not need so much good nutrient stock for trees. So, so this is something which really should be more uh, taken care about and think about beforehand. So it's basically I would, if I, if I just really cut it to very short message, 
compaction is important once it came to trees. Uh, nutrients is more important when it came to agriculture. And I already mentioned that yesterday, but there was some question about that. So this is example from Germany when they use this brick to uh, transfer the soil. And actually historically what they did was they just, the brick was going and they just taking this um, They just taking this part uh, first, they put it down and then they take this part after and put it up. And this actually result in uh, accumulation of high pyrite sand in top layer, which cause problem with high acidity, which difficulty to uh, restore the land. Uh, recently, uh, there is uh, Another technique used, so it's basically you just uh, store this somewhere uh, on, the, on the pile and then you just uh, dump this uh, pyritic material in the bottom and then you cap it by several meter of this quaternary sand, which is good for, uh, for a plant grow, which is good for forest grow as well as for agriculture reconstruction. And it's a little bit more complicated. You need to have this stockpile, but doing that, you actually get rid of all this acidification problem, which otherwise would be extremely costly to solve during restoration. And I would like to use this picture uh, to illustrate one more things. So basically in most heaping techniques originally, you get some kind of irregularities. Uh, you get these uh, ridges. Uh, no matter you know how you how you dump it, if you if you bring it by dozers or if you bring it by conveyor belt, like in this case, certainly in certain cases, if you have conveyor belt going all the way to your to your site, uh, you can keep ridges very easily. If you uh, basically are moving, so for dozer to put another layer or for some of these conveyor belt, which are particularly those which are supplied by railroad, uh, you need to level a terrain uh, around conveyor belt uh, the, or an, uh, around this, this, this dumping machine because uh, otherwise you cannot move. But even in such cases, there is often possible for this very last layer to leave these heterogeneity uh, intact. And I will just speak about that uh, later, why this is might be needed. So basically, uh, at the end of previous lecture, I show this conceptual slides, which basically show us uh, for different environment, wet or dry environment, different options, what we can do with initial soil preparation. So we can do nothing. We can level the soil by grading. We can transfer the soil blocks. We can reconstruct the soil by putting subsoil and topsoil or maybe even topsoil. And on this gradient, we actually reconstruct more a uh, complex technosoil, we like uh, make initial conditions better in terms of nutrients, but we pay for that by increased compaction and some other problems I will mention later during the lecture. So basically, as you see on the graph, once we moved from the left to the right on the picture, in the left side, there is better condition for reconstructing a forest. If you have wet situation, the forest actually often came by its own if you do not do any grading. While if you basically have more, uh, well, if you have dry conditions, the, the, soil didn't, the forest didn't came anyway, because you know, if you are in the 
prairie zone or in the savanna zone when the forest is not growing naturally. I, I don't, I wouldn't recommend, you know, to go there for forest because you would have to go for some really exotic species and that's usually uh, not beneficial. So basically, uh, basically, uh, we can say that the more we compact the soil, maybe better for you know establishment of agriculture land because we do more for soil preparation, but less we do that, it might be actually uh, good for forest. Okay, so let's start to go uh, through this diagram and to look on the particular points in the diagram and what we can do, how we can put that to action, and what is the cons and pros of individual approaches. So I'm just saying, and I just say that, you know, the forest, in, if you are in the zone, when the forest naturally occurs, certainly, if you are in desert, it's uh, really uh, hopeless to expect the forest to okay, certainly. But if you are in the forest zone and if you keep ungraded surface and if you are in a reasonably good connection with surrounding landscape, then the forest might easily came by its own. It might not be so fast in the beginning, but outcome after a few decades are actually very good. I'm just showing you a couple examples of that. So this is actually a picture from Tennessee. The left uh, picture show original hardwood forest, never mind, uh, used for you know logging, selective logging mostly. The right is a forest, it's also hardwood forest, which developed by its own in post mining land. So there was no action taken. Mining just finished. They, they left it as it is and went home. And after about 40 years, this picture is taken about 40 years after mining, you see you have quite well developed hardwood forest. This is a little bit picture taken a little bit longer. So this is in about 70 years old sites. Both of these sites were actually mined and the left picture was planted by white oak while the red part of the picture was left for natural succession. Certainly here you might see quite peculiar differences. So you see that the right side of the picture is formed by basically airborne or the trees which have airborne seeds like a poplar, uh, yellow poplar, uh, platanus, uh, ash, aspen, so this is this is a trees which have a seeds that are wind blown, while on the left hand sides when this was planted you have dominance of white oak, which certainly have much heavier seeds, which would be difficult to came on the sides in such large density. So, so this is certainly kind of limitation. Um, finally, on this picture I show you comparison of two current sequences we study quite often in post-mining sites in Sokolov. And you see sites which are 10, 20, 45 years old. A top row of picture again shows situation when the miners left this bridges, this, this wave-like appearance of the surface as created by mining and basically do nothing. And we'll even track down the 100 years old sites of the same origin, and they are already covered by uh, oak, beech, forest, with some you know, addition of spruce and other climax species, and still some presence of pioneers like aspen or birch. So basically, in 100 years, you have close to climax forest which by the way would be faster than if you, or, or at least equally fast, because if you uh, 
uh, in the first generation, you plant this alder, you keep it till 80 years, then you uh, as the check law require, then you cut it and then you plant, plant this climax trees. This climax trees would be about uh, 20 years old, 100 years after reclamation, but if we allow succession to work on, we have about 40 years old uh, climax tree forest of 100 years from reclamation. So in long run, this is very comparable and it's even better, yeah? So this is another message I would repeat throughout my lecture. Then we really need to look on, not only on the short term improvements, but also on the long term impact. I, and we need to appreciate that both of them are important. I certainly, appreciate, I certainly agree that sometimes you need really fast recovery for some processes, because if the mining heap is on the, you know, close to village, and there's people living in the village, and you tell them, you know, succession do it better, but you have to, um, you know, suffer 15 years from dust and uh, extensive erosion and all that. They wouldn't be happy and 50 years is basically somebody chilled hold yeah so so it's actually makes sense socially makes sense economically for the particular neighborhood so for that we really need to fix it as fast as possible even if the long run effect might be a little bit worse but in some other places we might afford to wait a little bit longer it will be cheaper and more importantly the final outcome might be even better. So this is things we should balance. I will spare a few slides now, a little bit of time to really illustrate the differences in this uh, unassisted ecosystem development uh, and uh, alder plantations, as I show in this kind of sequence picture in previous slides. So basically, if we look on the biomass, woody biomass production, we actually see that the woody biomass in this alder plantation is higher in five-year-old plantation. But in already 25-year-old plantation, this shift and succession sites uh, do better. And this really keep going in all the sites. So, and uh, we can actually also measure these sites repeatedly in age around 30 years. And we can see that annual increase of woody biomass in tons per hectare is actually much faster in unreclaimed sites than in reclaimed sites. A um, little bit surprisingly, when we look on the vegetation cover or woody cover establishment, we really didn't find any difference. And that was mostly because some of these reclaimed sites also failure. Yeah, so, uh, uh, but generally uh, more often, and we don't have really so much of these unreclaimed sites, that's also a drawback of this study. Yeah? So but generally, uh, I would appreciate that reclaimed sites might be a bit faster, usually is, but uh, overall, the difference is not so big. If we look on the development of uh, forest stand parameters, we can actually notice important difference in the number of trunks, number of trees per hectare. You see in this post mining land, they plant trees in very high density, which means they plant 10,000 trees per hectare. So one tree per meter square, basically. And in five years old, there is still over seven and a half thousand trees surviving. And the number of trees gradually is reduced either by self thinning or by, you know, thinning die by, uh, by management, uh, by, by the company. Basically in 45 years old, we have about 1,600 trees per hectare. Interestingly, in uh, successional sites which were not reclaimed, we have much lower number of tree trunks in five-year-old sites. So we have only about 
1200, but the number is gradually increasing and reach highest density in four in 25 year old sites when we actually have more tanks than in reclaimed sites the same age. But then by self thinning, the number of tanks decrease again and in 45 year old stands, we have basically the same amount of trees on reclamation or in succession in this particular study. I already mentioned that these trees uh, in reclamation when they are 30 years old or older, they might not grow much faster than these successional trees. Um, this is example of that. We have this uh, fancy sensor here, uh, which allow us to measure uh, tree grow basically every day. And this is basically how much the tree um, uh, circumference increased throughout the season from 2013 to 2019. And we have that for Aspen and Alder. I actually make the Alder figure uh, in a way that the X axis have the same scale. Yeah. So basically the 40, uh, the, the, this, this, this uh, 20 millimeters is the same on both uh, figures. And we actually can see that this aspen grow, you know, order of almost order of magnitude faster than the alder, which is was planted. There is several reasons for that. Uh, we believe that one of the reason is that tree which were not planted, they have to overcome this initial bottleneck, which seedling establishment, and those which survive have actually uh, choose or happen to come, rather to say, to suitable microsite when the water and nutrients are readily available, particularly water, when they were able to build really massive network of roots to forage for water and nutrients. Yeah. So that this bottleneck is one of the one of the reason. Another reason we actually found uh, important is that architecture of the canopy in uh, unreclaimed sites is much more heterogeneous. Because of these waves, some trees are higher, some trees are lower. And this actually prevent formation even canopy top. And this gives some emerging tree advantage to get more solar radiation and to actually use these resources more efficiently. Finally, alder is nitrogen fixing trees and we found it still get most of its nitrogen from nitrogen fixing. And nitrogen fixing extremely, is extremely energy demanding process. So this alder is still spending large amount of energy to fix nitrogen, even if they don't need it. This certainly transfer to other soil properties development. Um, we can conclude that again, overall uh, development of carbon storage in both reclaimed sites and unreclaimed sites, it's quite similar. However, Reclaimed sites, the carbon stores faster at the beginning, and then in about 40, 50 years old sites is basically done. It doesn't go more. We will speak about that more when we speak about soil development in tomorrow lecture. And in reclaimed sites, there is some luck at the beginning when the carbon didn't store so much because of slow development of vegetation. And then it's actually exponentially grow uh, later on. We can also see much more mixing, much more perturbation in the claim sites as was shown in the picture. However, I already mentioned that, and I think it cannot be emphasized enough that 
this was only possible if we keep this original uh, rough and loose surface, which is way the appearance formed by mining. Uh, or we can reconstruct it certainly later, but it will be much more expensive. And you can see it also on these pictures, on the RL picture, you can see, on the A picture, you can see RL view of leveled site and ungraded sites. And you see this ungraded sites already have some woody vegetation established, but none of them you can see on the graded sites. And this BC is actually detail of ungraded and graded sites. And you can see much more grass on graded sites, but some woody vegetation on the graded one. This is another picture. Again, you can see far from camera, there is a leveled part of the same sites, which is much more covered by grasses than the part closer to the camera. And you can actually see some tree here in the place of pointing by, by pointer. And we actually asked mining company to prepare for us three sites which were graded and three sites which were ungraded. And we followed them for many years. And we basically see that the development of vegetation is distinctly different. In level at sites, we see more grasses and in uh, wavy sites, we basically see more woody species. And when we look on the woody species uh, in more detail, this is basically a number of trees per one acre. And uh, you can see that uh, there is much more, uh, much more trees on these wavy sites than on level sites. And if we focus on the trees which are taller than one meter, this was 12 years after heaping. So basically there is none in level at sites, but there is quite few in ungraded sites, which was kept wavy. Why is that? Basically, uh, we have this uh, uh, heaping process and they bring these mudstones, as you can see in the uh, left uh, top picture. And these mudstones actually contain uh, some of more, some of the more calcium rich layers, we call them pelocarbonates. And during weathering, you know, this material breaks to these tiny uh, uh, layers and it's actually break to the dust almost. And uh, if it keeps this wavy appearance, it looks like on the right uh, top picture. So you have uh, basically these stones, the spellocarbonates, you can see in detail on D, you can have different texture material and in the, in the depression between two waves, you can see this clay accumulation, which is marked by C. However, if you level the sites, basically most of the site look like this C. So it's, uh, there is some sealing because of clay uh, breaking down and it sealed the surface. And this actually caused compaction which came secondary. Just because of leveling, this clay material gets compacted, even if we don't run over it, yeah? Just because on this level at sides, there are water puddles formed and they basically form this, uh, form this compacted layer. And on this uh, picture here in the middle, you can actually see that this woody vegetation is just some uh, microhabitats to grow. This is another mining site in most, and again, you can see this dumped material of mudstones. You can see the site which was kept way, way after 30 years, and it's already covered by woody vegetation completely. You can see site which was leveled, and <clears throat> there is no, there is very little shrubs and woody vegetation, but definitely not complete 
who recover and because there is a really high com uh, competition of gases. This another picture uh, came from Tennessee and again show all this slope is actually left over. It's actually land after contour mining. So the mine just take a coal, which was in form of some layer here. And they came to the surface of so the mine, this coal until they reach like 15 meter height of overburden. And then they leveled the, the slope or they reorganized the slope. And basically, in some places they kind of forgot which was here, and in some places they level it, they compacted it, and they plant uh, Robinia, Agat Robinia pseudo agatia, which is actually native here in North America. This is detail how the Robinia is, is growing, you know, it's about 15 years after planting, so it's not really terribly good. And you see, there is uh, a lot of uh, herbs and woody vegetation. So it's strong competition for young seedlings, while this is detail on this ungraded uh, part, which was actually more coarse material. You see Professor Franklin here, which can be used as a scale. And you can see the trees are pretty doing pretty well. This is another example the famous experiment started by Dr. Ashby from Southern, Il Southern Illinois Carbondale University. And he actually generates several sites when, we, when he applied topsoil and when he do not do nothing and when he plant the tree directly to ungrade it over burden. And you can see on the left picture, uh, this, this uh, uh, sites when the topsoil was supplied and on the right you can see uh, you can see sites where the trees were planted to ungraded overburden. And basically uh, if you look at it in detail it certainly varies from species to species but generally speaking after 40 years, this tree planted in ungraded overburden do better. I would just notice this row of trees. You can see, you can see stick over there, who, which mark the row. So there was the row of tree going to camera, and there is no tree in it. So this row was planted Liliodendron tulipifera, yellow poplar. I will speak about in a in a minute in another. Uh, consequences. I just want to point how the compaction was severe for that particular species. Uh, what the compaction does, you know, compaction for trees actually reduce ability to develop your root system. So this is actually example of a black walnut tree, which was growing on or graded, ungraded uh, spoil. And this is the same species uh, grown in the topsoil. It's a sketch of the root uh, actually after excavation. You can notice there is this 20 centimeter scale bar and there is this 20 centimeter scale bar which is much smaller. So if we actually put it in scale, you know, the, the graded compacted root would be like that. Yeah? So the picture actually makes it a little bit better because uh, it's, it's not the same scale. Certainly uh, different trees grow differently and produce different soils. We might compare here, you know, uh, you might use this opportunity that in many mining sites, different species was planted alongside each other. And they actually uh, was uh, several species to, uh, to kind of uh, compare. And so we did, we measured the biomass and 
you measure soil carbon, and you may actually see, I will speak about that tomorrow in more detail, but you might see there is alder in the left and pine in the right, and there is really tremendous differences in soil development. Both of these soils about 40 years old. And there are also remarkable differences in the way how the tree grow. So some trees like large do extremely well in post mining sites. We have a conference before the summer school and there were people from Czech University of Life Sciences who actually show data than the large in post mining sites grow even faster than large planted in forest soil in surrounding landscape. The growth of other trees is not so magnificent. They usually grow not so good like in surrounding landscape, but they're still doing pretty well. But you may also notice that the amount of carbon store in soil do not correspond with uh, biomass. There is some trees which have not so much woody biomass and they store more carbon like alder and vice versa. You know, we often say that we planted this initial generation of trees mainly to uh, improve soil conditions, to stop erosion, to stabilize these slopes and after and prepare condition for maybe next generation of forest. So here we ask the question, how this uh, primary succession, unassisted succession, which uh, was on ungraded, uh, ungraded soil, how does prepare condition for climax trees, how this is in comparison which succession. And here we show the results for oak. So we study oak seedlings and we, uh, some of my students use this precise GPS and they map uh, oak seedlings distribution in reclaimed sites and unreclaimed sites. And we found a little bit over 350 uh, so we choose some polygons, which was about the same size and the same distribution across the heap, across the mining sites from north to uh, south. And we found over 350 uh, beach seedlings in reclaimed sites, uh, sorry, in unreclaimed sites, in non-reclaimed sites, we found 350 beach seedlings in the succession and in the reclaimed sites, we found one uh, beach seedling. So uh, maybe I should say the difference between these two was even statistically significant. And uh, so there was much more, much better establishment of beach in these reclaimed sites. We found the same for oak. Again, the oak performed much better in these unreclaimed sites than in reclaimed sites. Um, there is another thing which is noticeable. There is basically uh, quite a lot uh, beach seedlings in this uh, unreclaimed sites over here, but there is much less uh, in the south part of uh, in the north, uh, in the in the south part of the heap is more in the north, in the up, and less in the south. The reason is the south from the heap there is mine pit, there's no forest. North there is a forest which is actually source of seedling. So basically, also when we speak about this volunteer forest coming, connection to surrounding landscape is important. And we actually study this in detail and certain pioneer species have ability to migrate certain distances. For example, birch, they migrate really very far and they dominate in the central part of the heap. While for example, goat willow, clone ice in the neighboring part of the heap close to the closest willow. 
However, the general conclusion from this, as I just repeat, is that unreclaimed sites provide better uh, conditions for establishment climax trees, which was uh, beach in this case, but we have very similar results for oak. We also plant uh, oak trees and beech trees in this particular habitat. And we actually found that if we plant beech trees or oak trees under this successional sites, they grow better than if we plant them in reclaimed sites or even then when we plant them on the bare soil, in the bare spoil, in the, in the heap. One of the reasons for that can be that, uh, sorry, this is actually wrong, this is inverse. When we study ectomycorrhiza colonization, we found much more ectomycorrhiza colonization in successional site than in reclaimed sites. The same can be also reason for better establishment of spruce in reclaimed sites compared to planted spruce. Again, here is a picture of spruce, uh, the volunteer trees which came from surrounding landscape and established there. And they are basically uh, compared to trees which was planted. And in the graph, you can see height of a trees which was about 13, both of them was about 13 years old. And you see unreclaimed trees was about two meter tall, while reclaimed trees have 80 centimeters. So they are more than two fold bigger in reclamation than in succession. Again, we believe that major reason for that is better ectomycorrhiza colonization of the trees in uh, succession. And we also believe that the litter of this pioneer tree species like alder, like aspen, birch, willow, they actually acidify the site and, and uh, make it more suitable for as a rooting medium for spruce, which typically grows in acid soil, because in this particular mining sites, the overburden is actually slightly alkalinic, at pH about 7.58 when it's dumped. Uh, I should note this is not comparison of succession or reclamation, but this is comparison of succession which a planting tree in graded overburden, yeah? Okay, so if we wrap this up and compare succession versus leveling and tree planting, uh, so, so for succession, uh, we need really to avoid compaction and we want to keep as much spatial heterogeneity as possible because this spatial heterogeneity creates safe spaces where the seeds can establish. We might have slower initial growth, but faster grow after that in successional sites. And successional sites is good habitat for a climax tree. So there was actually several attempts, you know, the Polish colleagues, they came with quite sophisticated approach, how to use that successional sites and just when the they are about 20 years old. Some litter already accumulates, you know, soil start to uh, develop, they are ectomycorrhizae present. So you might use these to underplant climax trees like beech, spruce, uh, fir, you know, and some of them, particularly fir or, or beech, these are trees you would actually. Uh, I cannot say never, but it will be really great difficulties, almost impossible to establish them by planting them on uh, just overburden. Yeah, if you grade overburden and plant this more demanding tree species, you can never succeed. But if you have already spontaneous vegetation on plant on place, and you can 
in understory, you can plant these trees, you can have very big success, very good results. Certainly, the leveling allows better access to the site. So once you level the site, you can rate over it by tractor or any machinery, which means you can bring your people there much easier. They do not need to walk. You can carry them. You can carry all the trees, all the planting material, all the tools. Uh, you can fertilize easily because you can move by machinery over the surface, but certainly this causes larger compaction and we already speak about cost of compaction for tree growth. Uh, typically, if you plant these trees in high density, the density would be much higher than amount of volunteers coming at the beginning. So you will have much faster canopy closure and that may be good if you are speaking about protection against erosion, for example, but you should really think if the erosion is so a problem in your site. And as we, was, as we already show in several examples, the focusing on fast canopy closure may not always bring the best results uh, down on the road as we see on the example of comparing, you know, the volunteer trees growth and the planted tree growth uh, before. We actually compare alder here, which is unfixing trees, and we see this unfixing alder promote a lot of carbon accumulation in soil, promote formation of deep a horizon, but it's came on the cost for tree growth because end fixing, you know, needs a lot of energy. And also there is suspicion that too much nitrogen can actually might not be good for establishing of climax trees. It certainly depends what is too much, but uh, too much nitrogen can promote grass competition and it can also promote competition between ecto and ect endomycorrhiza species and it makes ectomycorrhiza species less successful in colonizing trees, which means less successful uh, tree growth for this climax trees. If we go for end fixers, which I would recommend in certain extent, we should uh, use local end fixers. We should plant them in mixture which target species and they might be very often removed by self thinning because you know the other trees might overgrow them and then these uh, trees just die out. And if it doesn't happen, I suggest to uh, to remove them by thinning. Basically, uh, it's actually desirable to plant mixed forest in the post mining sites. Usually, if the foresters plant, you know, the mixed forest, they usually plant clumps of trees and then they choose one. In the post mining sites, the way which is usually used that you play a row of, let's say, alder and row the other trees. Or uh, you might even plant, you know, several trees, four or five species. Uh, and then you just plant pieces A, B, C, A, B, C, and you just constantly rotate them. And the next row, you do the same, but you just don't start by A, but you start by B. So you have B, C, A, B, C, and then go on. So doing that, you actually get the mosaic of different tree species. Certainly, if you plant species in high density, like meter by meter or two by two meters, then uh, the one tree will take much larger area than that, yeah? You might, one tree might take, you know, 10 by 10 meter. So basically you plant almost 100 meter, uh, almost 100 trees in that area, yeah? So, uh, so it's basically when you are selecting these trees that survive, you should kind of have some plan which species you want to left and that species you should choose to be randomly distributed in area. 
but it actually gives you possibility to remove the trees which you don't want as a target, which you want there just to start up initial soil development, help other trees to grow like these nitrogen fixers. And you have also some security against the situation that some species didn't really establish. So you will have some hole, but the hole will be randomly distributed. And as I already said, because you will actually reduce your trees 100 to one, you know, even if you have 20% hole, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, so when you plant the trees, uh, uh, again, these end fixers, there's usually high uh, planting densities, which is uh, driven by fact the tree establishment in mining sites is typically low, but this is something which anyone should test on its, si its side because, you know, more planting densities actually means um, higher cost, not only because of tree, but also for future maintenance. And if you do for this high planting density, you really have to be very careful about frequent thinning. Frequent thinning, because uh, so you should came maybe every second year and do some thinning uh, to, to get more quickly on that uh, desirable density, because if you, uh, if you keep these trees and you really reach, you know, closed canopy very fast, then uh, your trees might be very thin, yeah? And when you thin them last, after on, they might suffer from any snow, they might break down, they might suffer from wind, they might be more vulnerable to any other uh, you know, disease or pests and so on. So this is something I already mentioned, but again, cannot be emphasized enough. Very often the regulators focus on indicator of yearly establishment success. Yeah, like closed canopy, for example. So we need to reach closed canopy uh, as soon as possible. But, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this indicator of closed canopy as soon as possible might not really mean that the site would be successful in long term. So in, in research and in a, in a practice, we really need to look on the old sites we need to for the record, and it would be very desirable to look on the some indication of long-term performance and uh, focus our management uh, decisions and regulatory practice on that. I understand this is difficult, but because very often, you know, when the regulators came, the sites on the top, which is based on volunteer, might be assumed in 20 years a, as a much poorer than sites which are closer canopy, which is down on the picture, but actually if we came 20 years later, the situation can be quite opposite, yeah? So this is something we have to work on and we should understand uh, much better. Certainly, this advantage of leveling and uh, heaping overburden depends on climate. So I will show that in the case of study we did across the United States. We have this study when we study soil development across the United States. We have sites in Tennessee, Indiana, Illinois, and Wyoming, which actually generate very nice rainfall gradient and climatic gradient from quite wet and uh, relatively warm Tennessee to uh, colder but much drier Wyoming. And when we see pH, we actually see, you know, most of the sites have quite close to neutral pH. Yeah? So uh, uh, here should we say that except of Tennessee, all the other sites 
and all the other side, the topsoil was applied. And this is how the site looks like. So this is Tennessee, Illinois, uh, Indiana, and Wyoming. Indiana goes to tall grass prairie, and Wyoming goes to short grass prairie, while the other eastern sites go to forest. And we see, you know, massive soil development in uh, eastern, in west, in eastern sites, even in restored sites. The same for tall grass prairie, but almost no really soil development in Wyoming. And when we look on all properties, we measure soil, vegetation, everything. We actually surprisingly find that if we apply topsoil in Wyoming, that the site recovery in Wyoming is much faster than in Tennessee or Illinois. So why is that? You see, uh, the short grass prairie has very simple soils. There is no perturbation. And once we apply topsoil, and once we apply right grass species and herb species, and they establish, all the ecosystem is basically set, yeah? So this is uh, the fact which was noticed before that in semi-desert environment, in desert environment, the pool of species that can actually live in the sites, which is otherwise stressful, is very limited. And the species are either there or not. And once you are there, you have your community. So in Eastern sites, you have several generations, several wave of species which replace each other throughout succession gradient. So actually the final community is much more complex and there are much more species which alternate each other during development. So that's why development in the Eastern sites take longer, you know, even if all the processes run faster, vegetation grow more vigorously, still, the system is more complicated and that's why it takes longer to establish. You might also remember this picture from Tennessee when I show graded uh, topsoil, no, no graded, no development, ungraded, good development. You might also see these pictures I show from Illinois when again development of trees was better in ungraded topsoil, ungraded spoil than on applied topsoil. So basically if you are in wet conditions and you want to produce forest, do as little grading as possible. If you are in dry conditions, on the other hand, uh, bringing uh, topsoil is really necessary because otherwise you will have no development. And when you do, you can have very good results. So this is again a summary, you know, Tennessee, 30 years Tennessee, and you see this ungraded uh, topsoil do really well, ungraded overburden, sorry, do really well. If you need to grade your overburden for any technical reasons, you can still, you know, make it rough and loose later on by increasing surface heterogeneity, as I already showed. And there is various approaches how you can do that. And this surface heterogeneity can trap water, slow erosion, provide, you know, safe spaces for vegetation to establish and so on. Okay, so this was comparison of forest development in graded and non-graded sites and what's the technical consequences of that. Now I'm going to introduce very specific techniques, which is soil blocks transfer. In some mining sites, the mining company can do, they basically take blocks of soil 
including vegetation, and they transfer it to another place and they just put it there. It's a very effective way of restoration, particularly if we are storing the kind of shrubby vegetation or grass shrubby vegetation or small trees. And it's very expensive because, you know, you need machinery to put it and then transfer it. But you restore everything at one movement. So you restore vegetation, you bring soil, you bring biota. So there is a very effective way how to restore the ecosystem, very expensive. Also, it requires leveling, which might bring a problem which connectivity of your layer you bring there, which the underground layer. So there's similar problems which connectivity as I already will, as I was speaking about in, in uh, topsoil application. You certainly might think about how severe this problem are. I never see that use in practice, but there would be technical options how to solve it. For example, you might make your surface a little bit rough and loose as I show or use some deep cultivation as we show in previous lecture and so on. You certainly are going to the store or donor site. Yeah? That's all, another thing that has to be considered. But because donor sites would be restored by mining anyway, it's actually uh, not so big deal. And uh, I already emphasized several times the reconstruction of ecosystem is not only about bringing trees or bringing a dominant vegetation, but it's also about bringing all the other biota. So basically connectivity to surrounding landscape is important. And that will be certainly better in place your mining sites, it's touching surrounding landscape than when it's touching the mine, for example. And when restoring that, you should be actually very careful about do not bringing additional migration barrier between your mining, between your deep or your site you want to reconstruct and surrounding landscape. So if possible, you know, do not make several row of bulldozer passes or heavy lorry passes, you know, between your ecosystem and uh, surrounding landscape, in particular, if you have choice to do the same on the other side, when your site is close to the mine, for example, when you already go on disturbed area, yeah? So this is practical, uh, practical connection. I already mentioned uh, fertilization. Fertilization is a little bit, you know, extra. It doesn't fit on the figure because you might use it. Once you level the site, you might use it because you have access to machinery. And I will spare a few words about fertilization. First, I would like to understand, again, I might speak about it tomorrow a little bit more, but I want you to understand how the nutrients actually development works during succession. Again, it depends on substrate. If you have sandy soil, sandy substrate, you will have naturally very little nutrients and the nutrients will be generally built up. But in many other situations, if you have disturbance and if you go to the bedrock, you actually have quite large amount of phosphorus and basic cations, which are marked by the red line here. But you have very little nitrogen. And nitrogen will accumulate by nitrogen fixing plant slowly, gradually over time. And these soil borne nutrients, they start to be more accessible during weathering. But once they start to be more accessible over time, they might leach out and system might suffer from lack of these nutrients. This example, this was like schematics, and this schematics is actually shown on particular 
chrono sequence of landslide here in Czech Republic. And you can see the same pictures of total phosphorus, mineral phosphorus was actually high in the beginning and they slowly gradually go down. Uh, nitrogen, which is blue line goes up and they go down once the phosphorus goes down and available uh, phosphorus actually increase by weathering by its decrease as the total phosphorus decrease. What does it mean? Some mining sites, when we bring deep layer up, particularly in situation when you have heavy weathering, like in tropics, when you have heavy rainfall. So these mining sites can actually easily contain more nutrients than original soil. I show it in the graph here, and my pointer here shows the phosphorus. And you see there is actually more phosphorus in uh, overburden than in surrounding forest. As a consequence, many tree species can grow better in overburden than in forest soil. I already mentioned large in circle of sites. I already show you this yellow poplar, Liriodendron polypifera row on transplanted topsoil when they don't grow due to compaction. But if you grow, if you grow this very tree, this Liriodendron polypifera on ungraded topsoil, it actually grow faster than in surrounding forest soils in Tennessee. So basically for some tree, you might get even better production because of surplus of some nutrients. It's not always, yeah, but in some substrate. Certainly in some substrate that are too sandy, too poor, uh, you might need to supply them uh, by nutrients, but you should keep in mind that not only nutrients, but also pH may be important, yeah? So sometimes there may be enough nutrients, but just pH is bad and you need to fix that. Uh, I already mentioned that yesterday, I want to repeat that in cultural land, we try to emphasize solubility, availability of nutrients. However, when we have missing a pool of nutrients, we have to restore this pool and this pool is mostly mineral, nut minerals, and organic matter. So basically we should use fertilizer. If you use mineral fertilizer, we should use fertilizer which produce nutrients very slowly. Very efficient and underestimated fertilizer in mining sites is a rock dust. What it is, it's basically a rock you ground on dust and you use as a fertilizer. Not all rock is suitable, but if they are suitable, they produce large amount of nutrients. They are slowly releasing, so they are difficult to overdose. Certainly the content of nutrients is not high like in industrial fertilizer. So you should apply a large amount of that, which means it's difficult to apply. And it's also difficult to transfer on large distances. And as I said, not all rocks is suitable. Again, I emphasize when you are going for forest, you should be very careful how much nutrients you want to add because you might easily overshoot nutrient needs of your system. And you might get to sites when there is too much grasses, too much grass competition, not so good for forest as I already mentioned. And finally, this I should show before, I mentioned the pH is important. So sometimes if your site is too acidic or too alkalinic, you might have nutrients there, but they might not be accessible, yeah? And basically during ecosystem development, the pH get more close to slightly acidic and the nutrients get accessible. And you might adjust pH by liming, or even if you have too 
alkaline substrate, you might add sulfur to uh, make it more uh, close to a neutral. Okay, we speak about topsoil application. So topsoil application, as I already mentioned, is often associated with leveling and with another compaction. Uh, instantly improve soil condition, bring the nutrients, might bring the seeds if you use proper donor soil. And it's very useful if you want to reconstruct the grassland type of vegetation or shrubby type of vegetation. It increased compaction, might cause surrealization, and might bring too much nutrients in invasive species. The benefits are generally higher if you directly transfer topsoil, but it is not always possible and topsoil is often stored in stockpiles. In stockpiles, you know, nutrients get released, carbon get lost, uh, exotic species might propagate. So uh, again, uh, if you are restoring natural or semi-natural habitat, you really should be more careful use uh, direct hauling and to have your donor soil which do not have any exotic or problematic species. Another problem with topsoil application is that there might not be good connection between layer under the topsoil and your topsoil you apply. And basically this might cause some problem uh, with water movement it might cause also landslide because the, you know, you apply a layer might move over that discontinuity layer. Again, this can be improved by uh, making your subsoil medium rough and loose and also by matching a texture of your underneath layer and a topsoil layer. This is just graph showing that uh, during topsoil stockpiling, you compact the soil and when you uh, remove it, you have high respiration, so you lose some carbon, but this is overall not so big problem. You might use other amendments like peat, um, and they usually promote vegetation formation, but they might not last forever. Some mining sites, they try to use, you know, charcoal, particularly if you have source of that, but to, this, to reach, you know, really substantial improvement, you would probably need to use large amount of charcoal. I never see that applied in mining sites. However, what I'm showing you here, the right, is terra preta, which is uh, laterite soil, low fertility, which was, however, by ancient uh, South, Asia, South uh, American culture supplied by a large amount of charcoal and turned to very fertile, very productive soil. So if you want to restore agricultural land, uh, you typically, you, you can do it on subsoil if you have less or if you have some other suitable substrate, but typically it includes topsoil application. After topsoil, you usually use massive organic fertilization, and then you plant legumes or grass legume mixture to allow carbon stock uh, built up and to allow, uh, you know, soil recover. Uh, many people believe that it's actually useful to incorporate organic matter to tillage by tillage to soil, but actually, usually tillage reduce your carbon, yeah? So if you want to build up your carbon pool, even if in agricultural land, you should keep it, in you should keep it as less disturbed as possible. This picture show actually development of carbon stock in tall grass prairie after they start to be tilled. And you see in long run, you are losing the carbon. So to wrap this up for forest, we should be looking for compaction. Even succession might give nice results, but certainly 
planting trees are faster, even if might not be long-term better than uh, succession. Nitrogen fixers are even faster. They produce very nice soil development, very good establishment, but again, they might be, not be good in long run and we should use them rather in initial stages of forest development. And we need some long-term evaluation tools, which uh, we still work on. For grassland and arable land, we need topsoil reconstruction. We need to put large amount of organic matter and we keep, need to keep this undisturbed as much as possible. So that's it from uh, my, my talk. And uh, I'm open for uh, to answer any question uh, if, if, you, if you might have any. We still have, we still have 15 minutes for questions, so. Yes, Professor, I do have a uh, little two questions. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, good, good. The first issue is about uh, when you make a presentation, I saw that succession is much better performed than that of reclamation. And then what, what I perceive is... It's only if you have good climatic conditions mm -hmm. and if your substrate is not toxic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. The last question is about um, regrading and then ungrading, grading and ungrading. If you make grading, mostly devastation is like what happening is grasses. And then in case of ungrading is vegetation, to my knowledge, the source for the vegetation cover might be the climate, the topsoiling, and then the seed source plant existence on that locality. So how grading or ungrading control the vegetation type? Um, I'm not sure if I understand you correctly, but basically what we saw from our experiment, if we grade it, mm -hmm. we promote grasses much more than when we keep it ungraded. Okay. So if we keep it ungraded, and if you are in the forest zone, we actually have better establishment of trees. Certainly, if you are in dry conditions or if your overburden is somehow bad, for example, too acidic, too uh, extreme for any reason, mm -hmm. then bringing uh, some subsoil or topsoil is necessary, yeah? And again, if you are in forest zone and you might allow to cap your bed overburden by a little bit better overburden and keep it rough and loose, then you might go for forest. But if you are in non-forest zone, you are in, you know, uh, savanna, then you might need, you might like to bring topsoil regardless of compaction and you want to go for grassland and you, you, you can seed your grassland anyway. Yeah? So you seed your seed mixture, which resemble uh, the native grassland and you will go for grassland. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. I'm not saying you should go for forest no matter what. Yeah, we already speak about that uh, yesterday. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, other question? Pavel, do you have some question? Yes, uh, yes, Professor. Uh, I'm wondering if there is any threshold of soil compaction that unable to plants to forests growth. Yes. Because uh, before, in, in last week, uh, in last week lectures, uh, I could see um, quite different results of soil co compaction from different spoil heaps. And yesterday, uh, Professor Masto said that after a few years, the soil compaction could decrease uh, after a few years of uh, plant cover. So I don't know, uh, yeah. I think yeah. this threshold, if it is some, it, it, it's not very strict. 
it's uh, it certainly depends on uh, the substrate you have, depends on pattern of weathering, and uh, uh, it depends on pattern of weathering, and uh, so I can believe then in some substrate, you, you see, certainly if you grow vegetation, you release compaction over time. But for example, if you have high clay soil and you grow grasses, you can release compaction a little bit. And yes, if you plant 10,000 trees by hectare, some of them will do it, yeah? Like three quarter of them will do it. But if you will leave that for trees to come by its own, they wouldn't make it. So, so it also depends how you, how you try to compare it. But you have to plant about twice as much trees than you plant for normal forest, uh, you know, replanting, yeah? So, uh, so basically, as you said, you know, there is no really narrow uh, cutting edges. They would be really site specific. They would be specific for each substrate. And, uh, you know, finding this threshold would be a task for future research. We don't, we don't have that. Yeah. This is something we work on it right now. And certainly, this is not like absolute threshold, yeah? So if you, I mean, if you have pH two, the tree will not grow, that's the threshold, yeah? Certainly if you compact under certain level, the tree will not grow, no matter what. But there is a zone when the tree grow not so good, but if you plant, you know, dozens of thousands of trees, some will make it. Yes, so you can overcome this by putting extra effort somewhere else. So what I'm just saying here is just, you know, a trend. I know many people level it and then plant the trees. And if you plant a really large amount of trees, if you go there and cut grasses, so you reduce competition with grasses, you can make your tree established. But it's actually much more expensive than if you plan them to overburden straight away. Yeah. So I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that you cannot put the trees there. I'm just saying it's more complicated. Especially we have to go there very often with yeah, so cuttings. You to, if you put, you know, sometimes you can overcome it. It's more difficult, but if you put extra effort and people usually do that in reclamation, uh, then this is possible. But what I was talking about is to try really to understand these natural processes and then make your reclamation in a way that you can use them rather than battle them. Understand. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, any other uh, question? Hello, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Myself, Anam. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. You do have a question? Uh, sir, you are an expert in soil eco restoration ecology. I just uh, wanted to get your opinion about the application of bio, uh, biochar in case of uh, uh, restoration of degraded lands, application of biochar in coal mine uh, habitat. Yes. Because, uh, you know, sir, in coal mine spoil, a large amount of carbon uh, fragments in the form of coal, coal, coal fragments. Okay, then how we can differentiate the effect of biochar as well as because already the carbon amount in organically, uh, sorry, in geological form is al already available. Yeah. So is it is it a right direction to application of bio uh, biochar or reclamation for restoration of that uh, degraded coal mine soil? Yeah. I, I would like to get your opinion, sir, not yeah. a question. 
Yeah. So uh, this is two part of the question. The first question was, what is the role yeah. of geological carbon and then biochar, mm. if I understand that well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, sir. Mining mm. soil, you often have geological carbon. Yeah, and yeah. Sometimes yeah. amount of carbon is higher than in surrounding landscape. In yeah. some of the sites I was showing, you might easily have 10% of carbon. 10% mm -hmm. of carbon is more than you can expect in a very humus rich meadow soil. Yeah. Mm. And then basically this geological carbon can have several origin. You, yes, might, have, you might have coal and the coal have very high CN ratio. So yeah, you have yeah. a lot of carbon, but almost no nitrogen. Mm. Or you might have kerogen. Kerogen is actually usually in overburden. It's mm. formed by algae, you know, if the overburden was formed by lake. Yeah, the yeah. Accumulate, they form this kerogen. And the kerogen mm. have very suitable CN ratio, like right, 10. Sir. Right, sir. Mm. So if you have kerogen, it's usually largely support your soil development. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the ger kerogen is actually good. Mm -hmm. Having more coal is really questionable. There are yeah. some trials when the coal is uh, good. There are many other trials where the coal appear bad. Mm. Depends on content of uh, metals in coal, mm -hmm. but also depends on organic material uh, character, so to say. Because, because uh, uh, coal can contain a lot of free phenolics, they can mm. contain PAH, so these can be toxic for plant, they mm -hmm. can be acidic. They can be, they can promote metal, con, metal toxicity. So right, as concerned the coal, they are approaches of using coal dust to improve soil fertility in mining sites. And mm -hmm. they are successful, but there are also studies showing application of coal dust is uh, reducing, you know, soil fertility. So mm. it's really vary from coal to coal, depends on organic content and depends mm. on uh, iron on metal content. Mm -hmm. Finally, as concerned the charcoal, again, there is large amount of charcoal, depends yeah. on sources you use and the temperature you use for burning. Yeah. Mm. Yes, so sir. some charcoal can be produced, for example, from based from uh, a water purification station, and they might have, you know, metal problems. Mm -hmm. Other might be produced from biomass and depends on temperature, they might be better or, uh, or, or, or worse. Mm. So again, I would be, I would say carefully positive about testing charcoal, but mm. again, it's not a silver bullet because there is a large variation in charcoal res results. Yes. And I yes. don't really see enough results from mining sites to say mm -hmm. conclusively it's which condition, what type of charcoal is good or bad. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. This is, this is, I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot be more comprehensive in that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. There is time for one more question. Yeah. yeah, we have a question from chat from uh, Ms. Sarah Peles. Professor Froze, would you recommend the application of charcoal as amendment to grassland reclamation? Again, uh, if your aim is to increase grassland productivity, I would be carefully positive about that. But basically, it's what I said, you know, there is many results showing that particularly low temperature charcoal, which was produced at 200, 300 degree pyrolysis and made from uh, reasonable quality organic material. So not from, let's say, 
uh, some waste which contain a lot of metals and so on. I will be positive about that. Carefully, I will at least assume that as a word to try, yeah? But again, I don't think we have enough data about Cherokee and mining sites application to really uh, be conclusive in that. But I would say it's worth to try. Thanks. Uh, okay. Professor, can I ask one small question? Yes. Yeah, uh, there are two questions. One is uh, rock dust. Uh, from which rock it is made and whether it is in practice, whether it is apply, applied in the mining soils. The second question is how you can differentiate kerogen and coal. What instrument is needed to differentiate whether this carbon yeah. is from coal yeah. or kerogen? So, yeah. so basically, basically, kerogen, you can, if you do C and ratio of the overburden, and you have high CN ratio, it's coal, low CN ratio is, is kerogen. Mm -hmm. But you can also use, for example, NMR, it's much more expensive. Okay. NMR show you the kerogen have more aliphatic components mm -hmm. and coal have more aromatic components. The same, you can use mid infrared spectroscopy to, okay. to answer the same question, yeah? But basically, for the first uh, estimate, the CN is a good indicator. It's probably the cheapest one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, kerogen, usually you don't see. So it doesn't color your material black. Mm -hmm. Contrary to coal, that's another indication. So that was the first question. Uh, yeah. The second question. Rock dust. Rock dust. Uh, again, there is companies who produce this uh, rock dust on commercial basis. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, they are usually able to track down local queries and make chemical analysis from local queries and tell you which one is suitable. But typically, volcanic rocks, for example, are often very suitable for that. Yeah. So that is in practice, application of rock test for mine reclamation, it is in practice in Europe? People are following uh, no, that? No, no, I, I didn't see it so much, okay. but I would actually assume it as very promising. But I do not see many examples of somebody who's doing that, actually. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Okay, so if uh, so, we can meet in half an hour, and we will speak about water, uh, water in mining sites. Yeah. So if you would have some question, we can answer it after the afternoon lecture as well. Uh, okay. So thank you for your attention so far, and see you in half an hour.
Dobrý den, slyšíme se. Ano, ano. Halo, halo, dobrý den, slyšíme se. Ano, dobrý den, já slyším. Nevím, pan Frus, asi ne. Já tě slyším. Aha. Slyšíš mě, Jirko? Jirko, slyšíš mě? Halo, halo, slyšíme se? No, Jirko, my tě slyšíme. Já tě slyším dobře. Honzo, slyším tě? Já tě slyším normálně, jak teď mluvíš tady přesto. No, ale já tě neslyším, já tě slyším z telefonu, ale... No, ale teď jsem odmutovaný, měl bych tě slyšet, slyším Agátu, fungují ti sluchátka? Můžeš, prosím tě, ještě jednou? No, slyšíš mě? Ne, slyším tě jenom z toho telefonu. Já si tě vypnu. Hele, když vytáhneš ty sluchátka, no, 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 by si na ty repráky, co máš v tom. Neslyším, tak někde je nějaký problém. Když by si vytáhl ty sluchátka a jel jenom na ty repráky a mikrofony, co máš v noťasu. Nebo ty máš stolik teď, 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 teď tě slyším, jo, perfektní. Slyšíš mě teď? Jo, teď tě slyším úplně perfektně, ty předpokládám, že mě slyšíš taky. Jo, slyším tě, tak já nevím, v čem byl problém. Uh, jo, ono je tady několik uh, voleb, kam má jít zvuk a zjevně jo, jo, jasný, do sluchátek, ale když jsou zapný... Dole, dole je share screen, vidím. tam si to můžeš nazdílet normálně. Takže tady, když vyberu, teď to vypadá, že by mělo být... Normálně klikneš na to share screen, objeví se ti ty, co máš... Výborně, už to tam je, post mining land, vidíme to. Zkus to ještě do full screen modu. Jo, perfekt. Jo, takže takhle to běží, jo? No, zkus to přepnout ještě o jeden obrázek, aby se mi to běží. Jo, jo? perfekt. Jo? Ještě, ještě prosím tě, zkusím tady nějaký ukazovátko, jestli i tohle běží, běží, jeď. Běží, jo, běží. Hele, dobrý, jo, já, tak já, jdu, já jdu dohoutnout oběd, jo? Tak jo, díky moc, ale... Já vám to ještě schodím, jestli můžu. Jo, budete hodná, já v tom prostředí zoomu nějak jako vůbec tady to teprve poznávám, co kde a jak. <laughs> Děkuju. Tak teď se mi to asi nepovedlo, já vám zkusím našerovat ještě. <laughs> já, já, já to zkusím teda zrušit nějakým způsobem. Tady klesto vše, jo? Teď jo, dobrý, tady, skvělý, proběhla. skvělý. Dobře, tak děkuji děkuji. moc, děkuji. Taky děkuji, naschle.
Hello, Michael. I didn't see you, you were there. Uh, yeah, I just, okay, so uh, if you want, you can actually start uh, early, you can start from 11. Mm -hmm. okay. and if, you can, if you can basically repeat what you said on that conference and make it a bit uh, broader introduction, maybe of microbes yeah. Yeah. and all that, and I can, and if, if it takes, if it takes you like 15, 20 minutes and I can follow on, follow on that. Okay, I added a, a few slides to, to make it more general or so. Yeah, also okay, that would be, that would be great. I can, I can actually, I can actually follow up, follow up on that. Mm -hmm. So if you start 11 and I will start, you know, whatever you finish, 11, 20. Okay, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Because at 12, we have a, a institute meeting and then faculty meeting and, and so on. Oh, I understand. This is very exciting. To kind of all these, uh, and at this time, it's really important to, to be there. And yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we have Friday, we have board of director, mm -hmm. uh, annual grilling. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, doesn't make you make a grill, but you will grill each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mm. Which is also very exciting, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. You know. <laughs> then we already start to keeping get messages from one uh, part of our institute, our center. Mm. Uh, that's the parasitology, and they just write, you know, us that they require that they actually deserve more money. <laughs> yeah, the usual thing, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, so that will be very exciting, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and which, by other words, mean that the other of us actually deserve less money. Yeah, because of, of course, yeah. So there's only a certain budget, yeah. Because yeah. budget is and basically. I, I, I know these discussions very well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very, uh, it's very exciting. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, then see you later. See you. Professor, I have a question. Yes. Uh, as you said that uh, you were using rock dust. Well, I actually, uh, you see this, this rock dust actually, I, I never really see that uh, some people will use that in mm -hmm. mining sites. But uh, I found that very promising to use it. Um. <laughs> so this is something I would suggest to try. Do we have any kind of research paper or research article on that? Uh, yeah, but it's not in mining sites, but I can send you some, yeah? Can you? Can you put me your email in the chat and I will send you something? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, good, I have it. Oh. Because I have seen some researchers on rock dust 
some Brazilian researchers were there. They were using volcanic rocks, actually. Yes. Some Brazilian researchers were there. They were using volcanic rock dust uh, as a fertilizer or to grow or to enhance the crops, enhance the yield of crops. Yeah, I, I also see it in that way. I don't really see it much using in mining sites. Yes. But I actually found it quite an uh, interesting option because, as I said, you know, when we use uh, uh, mineral fertilizer, which are easy to dissolve, and uh, because when you don't have really sorption complex developed that can store that nutrients and you don't have enough microbial biomass to bind that nutrients, then most of it gets just lost yeah? and it's not used by farms. So, so basically to build up, uh, to build up the, the pool of nutrients, I found that very, very useful. Okay, so it's one o'clock, so I will try to share uh, this water, water stuff. Um, okay, can you, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. Good. So basically, uh, today afternoon we will have two speakers. Uh, most of the first presentation was actually prepared by Dr. Psikrel, who unfortunately cannot be here. So I will try to reproduce his slides as best as I can. And after me, there will be uh, Dr. Peterka from uh, Institute of Hydrobiology uh, Biology Center will be looking more on the biota in the mining lakes and the fish in mining lakes and how we can manipulate the fish communities there and what we can what we can do about to make them successful uh, and uh, i should say basically our presentation this time is really focused on central european region from where we gather data and experience so this might be geographically somewhat limited, but we didn't really found anything better. So basically, as I already mentioned in previous talk, the mining strongly affect a uh, water regime. It might drain out surrounding landscape, and this can be avoided by putting some barrier, let's say clay walls inside the a soil and then after mining is finished this clay wall can be just uh, removed usually people do it in a way that they together with wall they put some predestinated places when they after that put explosive and they just break the wall to increase water connectivity however once the heap is is done we already mentioned that this post mining heap offer contain high uh, amount of pyritic material and this pyritic material by mineralization can produce uh, uh, can produce basically acids and these acids can dissolve uh, uh, many metals including iron and other and they can cause problem, not only in the heap itself, but also in the surrounding environment. So in the uh, right uh, bottom picture, you see a stream, which is affected by acid main drainage, and it's uh, full of iron, iron oxide, and you can really see this is not suitable habitat for any aquatic or for most aquatic life. Certainly, we already speak about this toxic uh, 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 habitat. So this is one of the reasons why we want to uh, reclaim them. Yeah? Because if we stop oxygen coming to these pyritic layers, we actually reduce acid main drainage as well. Certainly, if they are very small patches of these habitat, we can leave them because they can be valuable for some biodiversity. 
But if they are bigger, then the uh, basically negative side by producing acid main drainage and affecting life in aquatic environment far downstream is much more uh, much more problematic. We already speak about ways how to do it. And if we have still some acid drainage, another reason, another way how we can reduce it is actually a building a uh, uh, building a wetlands. Um, <clears throat> the wetlands might contain the part when the water move in thin layer, and then they may contain parts when they are plants, and they allow uh, coexistence of aerobic and anaerobic uh, places. These wetlands can be very effective in removing undesirable elements. Uh, from the water course, which cannot then continue to uh, surrounding water uh, so to downstream. This is, for example, a graph showing removal of uranium by wetlands. And the table here shows actually uh, water parameters in the mining uh, water, then in the water that go through the wetland, so this is treated water, and it's comparison with common surface water in uh, Czech Republic. And you can see that in many parameters like alkalinity, uh, like uh, iron, particularly uh, also manganese and some uh, other parameters, we can get substantial reduction in content of these impurities due to passage through a wetland. Uh, another characteristic uh, feature related to water in mining environment are post-mining uh, uh, lakes. The post-mining lakes are very often used in mining landscape and they can help solve the problem which listed material, which is due to extraction of coal. Because we already mentioned that if we uh, remove the coal, we basically uh, kind of uh, missing some material to backfill uh, the, the pit, yeah? So this is, and this, there might be other reason because we need to put some material on external heap to start with and so on. So basically, for all that reason, when the mining is finished, there is some void missing in the mining pit and we usually don't have enough material to fill it. So we can uh, fill it by water and create a um, mining lake. And the mining lake, besides solving this technical problem, also uh, offer possibility for creation of new habitats and provide many economical opportunities. Actually, when we generate a mining lake, um, one of the things which, again, should be emphasized is importance of littoral zone. And if we think about formation of mining lake far in advance, we can easily generate a littoral zone, which is a zone of shallow water close to the edge of the lake. And we can do that just by, you know, removing overburden in that uh, a level in a way that we can easily form shallow slope a few uh, dozen or rather hundred meter uh, long. This has many benefits. It can provide many ecosystem services in terms of littoral vegetation, uh, fish production. It can produce many economic opportunities. And it can be done for quite reasonable cost compared to future adjustment. And it can reduce abrasion of the slopes. This is one of the technicalities I'm going to mention here. Because if you have a lake, the lake is usually a big and the distance or the length of the lake in wind direction 
basically determine the height of the waves. So the longer is the lake in direction of wind, the bigger will be the waves. And the waves tend to basically modulate your shore in the slope of one degree. So what you want to have, you want to have your littoral zone, which have about 2.5 degree inclination. And doing that, you actually, can, if you have that for a few dozen meters, you can actually consume wave of energy, energy of waves by very efficient way. And you do not need any additional, uh, any additional uh, barriers to protect your, your, uh, your shore. If you don't do that, um, in the first Czech mining lake, there is actually the barrier made from stones, which are big as me. So it's like one by one meter stone or one by two meter stones. And this is terribly expensive to make. It, it costs, you know, thousands of euro per meter. And uh, uh, so it's actually cost, you know, almost million euro per kilometer. And it's, um, it's actually cost more than a million. It's cost two million euro per kilometer. So it's very expensive to make and uh, do not bring really any, uh, any benefit. It's just protect you shore. And if you, have this, uh, if you have this littoral zone, you can actually do the same in terms of protection, but you can also make another benefit. So this is example of uh, Lake Habazovice I was just speaking about, and the prevailing wind go in this direction, and there is a no littoral here. So there is actually this stony wall uh, for fencing. Uh, when you are making the lake, you can actually also think about shape of your lake, you know, by formulation of your mining pit. And by just a little bit of adjustment, you can make uh, your lake shore more natural, more uh, variable. So this is actually the lake uh, Habazovice, the first lake we just flooded here in Czech Republic. And this is Medart, which is flooded just recently. You can see the Medart pit and you can see the flooded outline of flooded lake. And you already see in that second plate, they do much better job, the mining company, and they really create the lake, which have very natural like appearance, at least in terms of you know, RL view. This is an example of three post-mining lakes of the Czech Republic, I, which we'll speak about most. So this is Khabarovice, Most, and Medart. The Medart was one I was just showing uh, in previous slide. And this is the filling object on Medart, which actually shows to, uh, which actually uh, serve to, to fulfill the, the Medart uh, lake. Uh, I should say that the lake was filled in, in uh, by river, by nearby river, Ohre, and also mostly, I will get to that shortly, and uh, mostly the bottom of the lake was formed by uh, tertiary clay material, which was mostly slightly alkalinic. So we do not have really any problem with acidity of these lakes. The water, as you will see, is close to neutral. And uh, we are showing some results how the water quality changed during flooding in this Habazovice lake. So basically, there is several stages uh, during filling. The lake started to be filled in 2001. There was large initial fluctuation, then it stabilized by about 2004, and then hippolymnium forced, uh, formed, and there is a first sign of eutrophication in 2005. I'm going to show it in uh, the numbers. So here is actually uh, relationships between maximum temperature and maximum depth. And you see when the deeper is the lake, the, the cooler is, uh, the bottom uh, water. 
the same is for uh, the same story or similar story can be seen for for um, oxygen concentration, particularly uh, when we look on the, the surface, you know, there is still enough oxygen, but once we get actually to deeper lake, you can see separation because stratification develops and we have summer and winter mixing, which summer and uh, uh, spring and autumn mixing, which brings the oxygen. The pH, as you see, is far close to neutral and um, basically conductivity is uh, higher when the lake is shallower and then slowly gradually decrease because there is, when the lake is shallower, they actually dissolve this overburdened material to the lake, but once the more water coming, the conductivity uh, decrease. Again, total phosphorus is actually higher at the beginning because total phosphorus again dissolve from this overburden, which form a bottom of the lake, but later on it's actually decrease. As a matter of fact, in the filling of Medart Lake, which I'm not showing the data here, they use little trick that small proportion, about 10% of water, which was used to fill a Medart Lake, they actually came from mining water. So they use this mining water, which we otherwise use quite nasty stuff, you know, acidic, high iron, aluminum content. And they actually used that in the very beginning of the lake filling, forming about five to 10% of total volume. And doing that, once they actually start to put the water from, from the river, uh, all phosphorus that may be potentially dissolved from, from the overburden or might came from the river was precipitated by iron and aluminum and sits in the bottom in insoluble forms, which actually reduce uh, phosphorus outbreaks. Uh, this is not the case of Kabarovica when we can see some phosphorus peak in the moment when the uh, in the deeper layer of the lake, when the lake, when the water can become anaerobic. Uh, you see there is a flash of chlorophyll on very beginning after flooding of the lake, because there is a huge class of nutrients available, as I already show, leaching from overburdened material. However, this will basically this will basically uh, level down uh, over time. Uh, the problem which was solved, which was speaking about in Chabarovice was actually the eutrophication. In Medard filling, they fill, they, they part of solve it by using this refining water. And uh, uh, however, after all this, this water quality in, uh, most of these filled lake in Czech Republic is pretty good. There is only two problematic, uh, the red numbers show the numbers which exceed national legislation standards. And there are only two uh, elements for which this has happened and that's the sulfates, which is obvious because when we have this pyrite, we have not only iron, but you have also sulfur. And then there is certainly dissolved solids, which is again a matter of initial flooding when you know the bottom is not really formed, the water is coming intact to overburden, can increase turbidity, and so on. Uh, other physical properties was also quite good. Uh, the metals was in the limit uh, of the expectation. I already mentioned the chlorophyll, which uh, reflects phytoplankton uh, development. And so far in this Chabarovice, there was only negligible water boom, which also depends on 
way how the fish community is manipulated and what about uh, Dr. Peterka will be speaking in a minute. There is quite good development of water plants. I think uh, also they will be uh, treated more in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the lecture. There was a large amount already when the stars filling and they were quite big because uh, you know surplus of nutrients and at the beginning water column was warm and not so deep. So there was quite large, uh, uh, ex large uh, production of uh, these plants, which might on the other hand also help down, help to regulate down this eutrophication problem. Uh, there is a flush of uh, zooplankton following flush of phytoplankton after filling and their basically dry mass of zooplankton is gradually decreasing with time from filling. So at the beginning, you have more nutrients coming to the system from dissolved overburden, and this actually caused a phytoplankton boom and, and zooplankton boom. Again, I should emphasize there is no really acidity problems, even if partly some acid main water was used, it was so diluted that the water in the lakes is neutral. Certainly, if it would be in Lusatia and there is large problem with acid main drainage, uh, the pH of the lakes is a very acidic. We wouldn't be speaking about so, uh, so suitable lake development. The zobentos have relatively high number of species. Uh, uh, again, depends on the filling. Uh, once the anaerobic zone, uh, once the hippolymnium is formed, which is not mixed, then there is strong decrease in zoobanktos, uh, uh, zoobanktos uh, appearance, and which means the zoobanktos amount decreasing once the, rot, once the lake is completely filled. To conclude, the experience we made with filling of large uh, uh, freshwater lakes in a mining pit in Czech Republic, there was no significant problem with water quality. The main process are good predictable based on hydrological theory. We have relatively low water inflow, uh, which actually uh, cause oligotrophization. One of the advantages of this mining place in terms of trophy is actually that this lake is comparatively very deep compared to other lakes in Czech Republic or in Europe in general. And the deep lake means there is a formed hippolymnium, which is part of the lake when the water is not mixing. Yeah? In the lake in temperate zone, we have a mixing. So basically, in the summer, there is stratification, the warmer, lighter water is in top, and the deeper water is in bottom. But because the water have higher density and four degrees, in autumn, one nice day, most of the lake have the same temperature and get mixed. However, if the lake is very deep, there is some very deepest part which doesn't be affected by this mixing. And this mixing actually is important because not only bring oxygen to the deeper part of the lake, but might also bring also nutrients to upper part of the lake. But once you have a hippolymnium, which is not mixed, all the nutrients which are produced by water column, which dead bodies are slowly, gradually sinking down to the bottom of the lake. And once you have this hippolymnium, which is not mixed, they get trapped here, and they're basically not released. So that's why we can actually produce a nice, deep lakes which very clear water, very oligotrophic, little nutrients. So it's a good for many purposes, including maybe uh, using for drinking water, but this is not the case because, you know, uh, we have to still supply water because evaporation in these lakes might exceed uh, the income. Certainly there is a hope that which establishment of um, Catchments, this might more or less, more or less level 
level out, but nobody knows really for sure. Uh, but water quality in this lake is excellent for recreational purposes. There is certainly possible risk with eutrophication. There is a risk with water mineralization and water availability, but those are quite solvable. So this is all from my parts. And I would now ask uh, Dr. Peterka if uh, he can share his presentation and continue about more about biological aspect of these lakes. Okay, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me, Jan. So, excellent, we can hear you excellent. We can see your presentation, you are all good. Perf uh, perfect. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, I have to say that this is my first uh, Zoom meeting. I'm very new to Zoom, so if something is going wrong, it's probably my fault, so uh, very sorry. But uh, I very much hope uh, we can manage it together somehow. I was uh, asked uh, by Jan to have a talk to introduce to you the highest trophic level. It means the fish or fish communities of uh, post mining lakes in the Czech Republic. Or more generally, to uh, talk about uh, post mining lakes uh, themselves. So I will try and will present them as very unique jewels of our landscape. What may be somewhat surprising, but so they really, uh, really are. Um, furthermore, at the very beginning, I have to mention that we are specialists in surveying large inland waters, and we often take part in managing their fish populations. But that is a job you can hardly do alone. So here is our team uh, standing behind the data, uh, what I am going to uh, present. Uh, it is not su surprising that open cast mining leaves the landscape heavily destroyed with really very deep scars. And after the mining activities are over, the landscape has to be returned. It's ecological, economical, as well as aesthetical uh, value. Uh, back. Here an example of uh, lignite pit Yiri uh, Družba, so you can see how heavily destroyed the landscape uh, is, but the landscape is, but you can, uh, I guess, uh, very well imagine. So the goal is to move from the previous situation to uh, the situation like uh, on this side, uh, this slide, and ideally uh, without any negative consequences. So this is a, an example of uh, Milada Lake, former Chabařovice Lake that is now called uh, uh, Milada. Uh, the hydric way of reclamation is uh, used because it's uh, very close to nature. And what is maybe even more important, it is uh, reasonably economic. So it represents a very perspective way of uh, uh, reclamation. So from the mining sites, uh, post-mining lakes are uh, being built. In the Czech Republic, uh, eight such post-mining lakes are going to be uh, realized. Uh, the areas will be of hundreds uh, of hectares uh, and volumes that will be tens to hundreds of millions of cubic meters of, uh, of water. Here you can see then in a map, the ones with uh, empty uh, dots like uh, here, Bielina, CSA, Bršany, Tušimice Libouš, Jiří Družba, they are uh, still being operated as mines. The ones that are represented in blue color are already realized lakes. So uh, you have heard talk from uh, Jan about Milada, Most, and Medart lakes, and I'm going to talk uh, about, about them uh, as well. 
all these sites are in the uh, north to in the northern to northwestern part of the Czech uh, Republic. All the mining sites should be uh, uh, revitalized uh, within next uh, 50, uh, 50 years. Uh, what is very important is that the fish community will be an integral and essential component of uh, these ecosystems, and it will evolve either naturally or with the help of men. And this help can be advised or inadvertent. Uh, what is very important that uh, based on biomass and species composition, the fish, the fish community that will evolve uh, can have positive or negative effect on water quality. And that by accelerating or decelerating the natural processes of eutrophication. So two situations can be reached. The one with clear water that is pictured uh, on the left part of the picture here. And on the other hand, uh, the one with uh, really green, uh, non-transparent water with blue-green algae blooms, uh, very unsuitable for recreation. But recreation is the, is the uh, the purpose that is uh, the more the most important uh, future use of the uh, of the lakes uh, that is planned. Uh, so, uh, with the with the uh, fish community, with the management of the fish community, uh, we can shape the uh, ecosystem towards one of these uh, states transparent water or green water. Uh, this is commonly used, it's uh, uh, called biomanipulation. So by uh, affecting the uh, uh, trophic, uh, uh, trophic pyramid, uh, you, can uh, you can push the, uh, uh, the ecosystem towards uh, the desired uh, uh, state. So, uh, the way how to do uh, this is to uh, reduce the amount of uh, planktivores here represented by roach that normally reduce the amount of zooplankton. When there is little zooplankton, you have a lot of phytoplankton and uh, uh, water is green with uh, blue-green uh, algae. And this is the state we don't want to have. So uh, how to help it is to increase the population of uh, piscivores. So the uh, amount of planktivores is reduced. We have uh, a high number or biomass of uh, uh, zooplankton and we keep the uh, planktonic autotrophs, the phytoplankton on low level. Uh, so usually we have a state with uh, very transparent water and very well evolved uh, uh, littoral zones with uh, huge beds of macrophytes. In the post-mining lakes, it is generally assumed that uh, the water quality will be very high. Uh, we should have oligotrophic conditions and that due to low respectively, respectively one time only and then after limited nutrient input. So the system is going to be uh, mainly bottom up controlled. So by the nutrients, not that much by the top predators, what is called top down control. And also due to the depth and stratif stratification of the lakes, uh, because uh, most of the lakes are going to be extremely deep. And in these lakes, the nutrients are usually bind binded to the sediment. Uh, but the positive or negative effect of fish still uh, uh, remains. And there are even farther uh, uh, reasons, not only the water quality, uh, why to manage the fish stocks. Because uh, even in case of assumed very high water quality, 
Uh, there are three more uh, reasons, mainly the water framework directive, diversity of water ecosystem and socio-economical aspects. The water framework directive uh, orders the EU, EU states to have their systems, I mean, aquatic systems, in as good ecological state as possible. So realizing typologically correct uh, fish communities will uh, fulfill this uh, requirement. Uh, in Czech Republic, uh, we have quite many uh, reservoirs, but uh, these, these, these systems are uh, not very mature, uh, with uh, some problems, mainly eutrophications, ma ma mainly eutrophication. So having systems uh, that will be oligotrophic with uh, typologically correct uh, uh, ecosystems of fish communities will um, represent very unique systems uh, among uh, these mainly uh, reservoirs, eutrophied systems. And the third reason, the uh, reason uh, these aspects, uh, uh, then we are going to manage very special uh, fish communities with high amount of uh, piscivores and other fish species like uh, salmonids or corregonids, these will be uh, very unique fish stocks that will be highly positively rated uh, and are uh, recently required by end users, uh, with which I mean uh, the anglers, recreational anglers. And in the future, this socio-economical aspect uh, will be even more important or uh, even the most important factor, factor. So what are the typologically correct uh, communities in Central, uh, in Central Europe? In uh, mountain oligotrophic systems, uh, the typologically correct fish communities are uh, uh, represented by mainly salmonids. In uh, shallow and eutrophic systems, uh, uh, communities dominated by pike perch and bream, or called pike perch bream communities, are uh, uh, typologically co correct. What is going to, uh, uh, or what lakes are going to be the post mining lakes? These lakes are going to be. Uh, uh, oligotrophic and very deep. For such a systems, uh, corrigonid communities are typologically uh, correct, and we should try to manage these systems to war, to, towards uh, this type of community. Uh, if the systems are going to be shallow, but uh, this is going to be only uh, one uh, lake of all these eight post mining lakes. It is the Lake uh, Milada. Uh, uh, for this lake, uh, uh, the uh, perch pike uh, uh, community is uh, correct. These two communities, the Corregonit and the perch pike uh, systems, are very similar. The only difference is that in the very deep ones, uh, we have uh, corregonids that are absent in the uh, shallow types. So, uh, typologically correct systems should be perch pike system in shallow lakes, but these, uh, the post mining la lakes are not going to be these uh, uh, types of uh, lakes. And in the deep lakes, uh, we can manage the system towards Corregonid piscivores systems or corregonid uh, salmonid uh, systems. It has to be mentioned that the corregonid salmonid systems are much more difficult um, uh, for, for, the, for the successful uh, management. Uh, so actually studying the, uh, for us, studying these, the main goal in studying these lakes is to verify the development of fish communities towards the desired states and to indicate potential risk for long-term sustainability of typologically correct fish communities in post mine uh, uh, in these lakes. So uh, just to sum it up, uh, uh, the, lake, the three lakes I'm going to talk about, the uh, most shallow is the and smallest is the Milada Lake, uh, 
245 uh, hectares, maximum depth uh, 25 meters. On the other hand, the uh, deepest is the most lake, uh, maximum depth is 75 meters. And the last one, the largest, is, is the Medard Lake, uh, having nearly 500 uh, uh, hectares. Um, for our surveys, we use, uh, we use, we use uh, so-called complex uh, surveys. Uh, we combine hydroacoustics and gill nets uh, because the gill nets uh, can be placed to every habitat, uh, every depth, uh, uh, both pelagic and uh, benthic uh, in the lake. And uh, we are, uh, from this data, we are calculating uh, the total uh, fish com uh, community comp uh, composition, uh, their abundance and uh, biomass. So let's start with the Milana Lake. Uh, the flooding of this lake started in 2001 and it was finished in 2010. Um, we have been surveying this lake from 2005, but from the very uh, uh, beginning, I mean 2001, uh, there were some uh, activities by uh, other research institutions, but we don't have uh, the data from them. So what we found in 2005 is here on this, uh, uh, on this graph. You can see that uh, uh, estimated biomass was a uh, little bit higher than 30 kilograms per hectare. What is not that much, but the increase that was based on some estimations uh, from pre previous years showed uh, quite uh, 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 rapid, uh, rapid uh, increase. The line represents the number of uh, species. So we have uh, in 2005 uh, about 13 species uh, in this lake. Because the uh, increase in fish biomass was quite uh, steep, we decided to start uh, introducing uh, piscivorous fish, all three piscivorous um, uh, fish that are available in Czech Republic, I mean pike, pike perch, and uh, European catfish, the wells. Uh, for 2005, 6, and uh, 7, they were introduced in relatively high numbers, about uh, 2 kilograms uh, per hectare. And uh, this have had uh, immediate positive effect on the uh, fish biomass. So in the subsequent years, the fish uh, biomass decreased. What, what was uh, the aim? Uh, because to retain a high water quality, as, for having the high water quality, we need to uh, keep the fish biomass low with high share of uh, bisevarous fish. Uh, what dropped was the number of species as well. So the system um, become to be uh, quite easy. The main play players are represented here. It is the perch, rat, roach, then piscivorous fish, uh, pike, uh, wells, and pike perch. And there are some other uh, fish species like ruff and tench, but their importance is uh, very low. Uh, so, the, what was very positive is that uh, what happened is that the number of piscivores increased during uh, the early time of the succession of the fish community in this lake, and uh, biomass or the, or the share of biomass of perch uh, increased very significantly. Uh, perch uh, is a species that is represented here on the photographs that in these sizes is a very important uh, piscivore. So uh, perch and other piscivores are highly wanted uh, fish species here. On the other hand, cyprinids like rat and roach represented it more or less uh, red color are uh, unwanted. Um, uh, comparison done in 2008, when uh, where we compared Milada Lake 
with other reservoirs in the Czech Republic, we have been uh, we have surveyed uh, during the 2008 showed that the fish composition in this lake is uh, uh, extremely uh, extremely different from uh, what we have in um, our reservoirs, but uh, different in a positive way. Uh, I have already mentioned that uh, the perch is a very important player in these lakes. Here you can see the histogram composition of different sizes of perch. So these are the young of the years. These are the older fish. And during these initial uh, states, the uh, perch represents such kind of uh, population composition that is dominated with very huge individuals. And these huge individuals uh, do not uh, reduce uh, uh, only the uh, other fish like the unwanted cyprinids, but uh, they reduce by cannibalism, yeah, even uh, uh, their population, uh, the, port, the perch population itself. So they keep the uh, young of the years on low level. What is positive effect for water quality what has positive effect uh, for water quality as well. So during the years, the uh, fish biomass decreased. And what was uh, positive uh, was that uh, the species uh, composition change uh, to, um, or was composed of, 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 of the share of festivals were very high. Uh, during the years, the share of perch uh, slightly decreased or more significantly dropped. And this was uh, done because uh, aging of the population after about seven, eight years, there is usually huge uh, decline because the uh, individuals are too old and they die. So what happened? Uh, uh, um, after this uh, decline of perch population was that the uh, uh, total biomass increased again and the share of unwanted cyprinid species increased. Uh, the nearly vanished uh, roach uh, uh, represented a very significant uh, part and that was because it uh, uh, after the, the decline of the population of perch and uh, roach and rat populations as well, the, uh, uh, the increase in population size of uh, uh, roach was not uh, affected by, uh, uh, by the introduced uh, piscivores. Here you can see again the size histogram of uh, uh, roach population in 2012. These are the young of the years. This uh, peak are uh, the fish that were born in 2011, 2010, 9, 8. So the population increase is uh, very continuous without uh, having uh, no troubles. On the other hand, in patch, now you can see that the uh, uh, population composition is completely uh, different from what I was presented earlier. So huge abundance of young of the years, note that uh, here we have uh, one or the higher numbers than uh, here. And there is problem uh, to get to the size uh, where the perch individuals are piscivorous. So we have very low numbers of really huge individuals. Uh, what happened? Um, most probably uh, because uh, the perch is a very literal species. On the other hand, the cyprinids mainly uh, roach, but uh, from some part uh, rat as well, are uh, in larger sizes uh, pelagic. So for the piscivores, it is much easier to focus on uh, literal fish species, I mean the perch, then on the in pelagic habitats living fish species like the roach and rat. So the increase in population size and uh, particularly to the sizes where perch can uh, uh, very 
effectively reduce the populations of unwanted uh, fish species was uh, quite uh, limited, uh, but uh, during years in, it improved. And it seems that the population uh, will in the future go in such a very regular uh, cycles. And what is important is to, uh, in the uh, part of the cycle where there are the maximal uh, abundances of biomasses, to still keep the high share of uh, piscivores. Because with this high share of piscivores, the situation is uh, uh, remain going in such uh, cycles. What would be okay for what will uh, for the water uh, for retaining the high very high water quality? Uh, with respect to water quality, I have to mention the importance of uh, submerged macrophytes because uh, they are uh, important, important nutrients uh, binders uh, and uh, the low uh, amount of nutrients that, that is available in these oligotrophic uh, systems, uh, when it is uh, uh, kept in the macrophytes, it is not uh, available for the uh, phytoplankton. So uh, the, the macrophyte community is from this respect very, uh, very important. Uh, the lakes are extremely exceptional when we compare them to uh, reservoirs because our reservoirs or practically all the reservoirs in the world and it, it, it's the, the the reason is they uh, they purpose is uh, they uh, they uh, they suffer from uh, extreme water level fluctuations these water level fluctuations affect mainly the littoral parts and mainly affect the uh, uh, macrophyte uh, community, but fish as well and other biota uh, as well. In these post mining systems, we have very exceptional uh, uh, macrophyte communities. You can see that the uh, community is composed by one, two, three, four, five, six at least. Uh, macrophyte species in uh, uh, Velada Lake, and the macrophytes go up to the depth of 12 to 14 meters, so extremely deep. Uh, in this uh, in this Milada Lake, the transparency is usually around six meters, but in the other lakes, like most transparency, the second depth transparency is even much uh, higher, uh, about 10 meters. Uh, I have to mention that uh, there were very few uh, problems reported during the succession of fish community in Minada Lake. One of it was uh, uh, the reporting of uh, such a multi-scale uh, cyprinids. Here the situation for rat, here the situation for roach. This is the normal scale the individual. This is the individual with, with very small uh, scales. Um, actually, uh, we, we suspect that uh, this uh, happened uh, due to uh, chemicals released from the geotextile that was used to, for covering uh, the bottom, then the lake, uh, uh, lake bottom was uh, uh, created. These chemicals got into the macrophytes after the macrophytes uh, grow, grow the, overgrow the bottom. And these chemicals in the macrophytes affected the development of uh, the fish eggs that were, that were laid on them. Uh, in all the phytophilic species, because the, both the rat and roach are phytophilic uh, species. We have never reported uh, the same in a perch, because uh, perch uh, laid the eggs in a very different uh, way. Uh, I have to mention that this was uh, re recorded uh, only a few years after filling the lake, and now this problem is uh, vanished. So 
the normal multi-scaled uh, fish. The second uh, lake is the, I'm going to talk about is the most lake. As um, the, the deepest lake, maximum depth 75 uh, meters, the uh, filling start or flooding started in 2008, but already during this time, the area of the lake was 45 hectares and the lake was finished in 2014. Uh, it was finally decided uh, to uh, manage a Corregonic Pistivores type lake, uh, but uh, it, this lake, because, because it has no natural inflow, would be ideal to manage a Corregonic Salmonid type lake. But I have already mentioned that uh, particularly the Salmonids are not that easy uh, to manage and it is not the cheapest way. Uh, but because the uh, managers of the uh, of this lake uh, were uh, really interested to, to has the uh, to keep uh, uh, actually not to waste it much money for the uh, fish stock, so the final uh, decision was to uh, realize the Corregonit uh, system for which the lake is idle as, as well. Uh, uh, one very important uh, uh, thing, we started uh, surveying the lake in 2008 and uh, more uh, deeply in 2009. In 2009, the main body of the lake, uh, what is represented on the picture uh, here, was about 150 uh, hectares large and it was completely fishless. But close to the main body of the lake uh, was this uh, water, or yeah, was this water body that was called, you know, was called a silver lake, uh, which was only a few hectares large, but uh, overpopulated by, by a common species like uh, rat, roach, and perch. In uh, the June 2010, uh, these two uh, water bodies, the Most Lake and the Silver Lake, uh, get co connected. And uh, this is very important because I have already mentioned 2009, the uh, lake was fishless. In 2010, when uh, in the middle of the, of the year, the, the two water bodies were, uh, get connected, we uh, got uh, an amount of fish stock in the whole most lake evaluated to uh, nearly 40 kilograms per hectare. Uh, and what we have reported was extreme growth of fish. Uh, uh, the, 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 the fish managed to populate the lake within one year. What is really uh, exceptional and very surprising. In 2011, we reported even much higher uh, fish uh, biomasses, so we immediately started uh, stocking uh, piscivores uh, for this lake because it is very deep and pipeage is not, uh, 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 and for, for pipeage, the, the conditions in deep lakes are not very uh, suitable. We decided uh, to stock only pike and wells. Again, uh, in uh, very um, high uh, numbers of biomasses. Here it was uh, even tripled uh, uh, for this lake. Uh, when you compare it uh, with Lake uh, Mirada, there was about two kilograms per hectare. Here we stocked uh, uh, about uh, six kilograms per hectare because the uh, idea was that uh, this lake uh, will be uh, flooded uh, very fast. Uh, it took uh, one, in, uh, one year more to take effect. So in 2012, we get to nearly 
or close to 90 kilograms per hectare. But uh, from that year, 2013, uh, 13, 14, 15, you can see that the fish biomasses uh, dropped to um, very positive uh, levels. And you can see that uh, from the very beginning, the uh, share of uh, perch is high and quite similar. We were successful in establishing the uh, piscivorous popu uh, populations, so uh, pike and whales. And because we decided to make a whitefish or colligonid uh, uh, lake from most lake, we started uh, 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 stocking Camarena whitefish in 2011. And immediately uh, from the year after, you can see that the whitefish, which is the light the blue, represented a very important part of the fish uh, community. The, a uh, very positive uh, effect of whitefish is that uh, it can use the whole body of the lake. It is a cold water species, so it, uh, it is using mainly the deep waters. In this lake, uh, the maximum depth is 75 meters, and up to this uh, depth, we have oxygen. So there is no problem for a fish uh, to uh, use the whole volume uh, of, the, of the lake. Uh, yes, that is the most lake. And the last one is the, uh, uh, the Medard Lake. Uh, the largest lake, quite deep, maximum depth uh, 50 meters. Uh, flooding started in uh, 2008, and it was uh, flooded from River Orger. Uh, is uh, somewhere here. Yeah, uh, here is the very short uh, tributary to the uh, to the uh, to the lake, and we started monitoring uh, the fish community uh, since 2010. Uh, in this case, the lake managers, the company that is responsible for managing the lake, was on the other uh, 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 on the other was very much interested to realize the Corregonid Salmonid system. What was uh, very different from the situation uh, in Most Lake, uh, there is a completely different uh, uh, company responsible for managing the uh, lake. And so here they were interested even despite the fact uh, that the uh, management of uh, this stock is uh, more difficult. Uh, uh, more expensive. So in this case, we decided to uh, start stocking uh, the Morena whitefish, whitefish and after the population of the Morena whitefish is uh, established to start uh, stocking brown trout. Uh, uh, yes, there are some examples of uh, such a management uh, abroad, mainly in Great uh, Britain. Britain. These systems are extremely popular by anglers, what is most surprising uh, when you uh, see such a, uh, such a beautiful fish like uh, this. And it is uh, even uh, economic with uh, a positive uh, effects on water uh, quality. So finally, uh, uh, even it is more difficult, it pays off. Uh, so uh, we were allowed to manage the lake towards uh, current unit uh, salmonid system, but um, there was a problem uh, we uh, find out uh, after uh, the uh, first survey of the lake in 2010. Because what we found here, found was that the lake was already populated by pike, but pike only, what is extremely unusual. Uh, what uh, had to happen is that someone stocked uh, pike into uh, this lake. There were very young individuals, individuals one and two years. Old, uh, old, but they were quite uh, many. 
So, uh, because pike is very effective in uh, predation on uh, brown trout, this was uh, the end uh, for our dream to manage uh, the brown trout population in this lake. But uh, we decided still to try to manage the uh, whitefish uh, population, part partly or mainly because the uh, pike is a sit and wait predator that is typical for shallow littoral habitats. On the other hand, I already uh, mentioned that uh, the marina whitefish is a uh, zooplanctivore uh, and later bentivore that is uh, for which is uh, characteristic the use of deep pelagic and benthic habitats. So ideally, these two fish species should not meet. So we started uh, uh, stocking marina whitefish. We did it for a uh, few years. Here you can see the larvae that were used. So uh, other as in the uh, most lake, here we use the larvae for stocking because uh, this system is extremely oli uh, oligotrophic. And our idea was that uh, when stocking larvae, they uh, will be uh, the one year, they will be better adapted for the conditions than when we uh, stock larger individuals that are, uh, that are uh, used to be in uh, conditions like uh, highly eutrophic ponds uh, or so. Uh, but uh, these larger one year old individuals were used for stocking most like. So here um, I'd like to show you on slightly different uh, uh, charts what happened. Here we have different representation for benthic habitats and pelagic habitats. Uh, in 2010, the first year of our survey, we reported uh, only pike in quite shallow uh, habitats. The, uh, the uh, dotted line here represents thermocline. So, uh, uh, warm waters here, cold waters here, and here the same. In uh, uh, 2011, uh, because the uh, uh, lake was flooded from, from nearby river Orge, uh, we found uh, a few cyprinid species, uh, parasit species. Uh, the uh, catch of uh, pike was even uh, larger than the uh, uh, previous uh, year, and we uh, captured uh, some marenas, um, whitefish corregonates, uh, represented here in yellow, both in benthic and uh, uh, pelagic uh, habitats. In 2012, there was uh, another increase uh, reported in cyprinids and peltids in the mainly shallow benthic. Uh, habitats and uh, the lake started to be well populated uh, by uh, whitefish um, catches uh, uh, in uh, uh, both benthic and pelagic habitats and both shallow and deep habitats. In 2013, what was extremely surprising uh, was these catches uh, of pike perch in very deep uh, pelagic habitats and very deep benthic habitats. And the next year, um, also, uh, also the uh, development of the fish community, the succession was uh, quite predictable. What was not predictable was again, or, or was, what was unusual was again, um, these catches of pike in uh, deep uh, habitats, what is extremely uh, unusual and uncommon, and drops in catches of uh, white, whitefish. So what happened, just to uh, summarize, summarize it, uh, within uh, these years, uh, uh, short after, uh, after our first uh, visit, in Cyprinids, there is a gradual increase in uh, mainly uh, shallow habitats, 
but uh, they were pre present uh, quite uh, in large numbers, even in pelagic, but only shallow habitats. In perch or peltids, there was increase in shallow benthic habitats, uh, very slight uh, occurrence in uh, benthic deeper habitats, but practically no occurrence in pelagic habitats. In Marina white, Whitefish, the situation is the most important. There was increase in uh, uh, catches in both shallow benthic and pelagic habitats, and increase after this increase in shallow habitats, increase in deep benthic and pelagic uh, habitats. But from the uh, year 2012, uh, we report this very sharp, very significant uh, decrease in population uh, numbers of these fish species. Here, just the representation how quite well the Marina whitefish population uh, did. So, in 2013, we had young of the years, then uh, fish that were about one year old, two years old, and, and older. Uh, or the fish. In 2014, they were uh, only the young of the years, but very few uh, or the fish. Uh, what happened with the pike? Um, during the years, we reported a really significant increase in the number of uh, pike, mainly in shallow habitats, but uh, we uh, reported uh, the occurrence of pike even in deeper, particularly panting habitats, but as well, but the pelagic habitats as well. That is really unusual and very uncommon. So it seems quite obvious what happened uh, because uh, in some uh, individuals uh, of pike, we found a lot of marina whitefish in their uh, stomachs. So uh, here are the results. At the very beginning, in 2010, uh, the pike individuals were the only fish in the lake. Uh, and because this is a piscivorous uh, fish, so in lake without uh, fish, what they do is they orient uh, towards large invertebrates like uh, dragonfly, uh, dragonfly la uh, larvae and uh, so on. You can see that the invertebrates they were used to feed on uh, were quite important even in uh, older years. What we found out uh, that except the cannibalism, uh, the uh, pike oriented towards the whitefish. So whitefish became the first and therefore the most, uh, 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 the most uh, uh, foraged prey by the, by the pike. Uh, during years, we started to have more and more uh, pike individuals with empty stomachs. So we uh, tried to, uh, or we used the uh, stable isotope analysis to uh, come to the result whether the predation on whitefish as by pike is what stands behind the decline of whitefish population. And the stable isotope uh, analysis showed us that uh, in pike individuals in the year 2013, 14, uh, about 70, 80% of, uh, uh, of its prey were the pelagic fish, what means the whitefish. So what was very uncommon is to report the use of deep benthic and pelagic habitats uh, by, uh, by pike. That means the habitats that are uh, situated well below thermocline. Uh, this habitat use lasted even the, despite a significant increase of cyprian peltic potential prey fish biomass in shallow benthic habitats and very well reflected the distribution of marina whitefish, the most preferred prey. 
Uh, therefore, what we assume is that the first experience with Morena whitefish, a spray fish, determined very strong predator-prey relationship among northern pike and Morena whitefish that finally resulted in very unusual habitat use in northern pike and significant decrease of Morena whitefish population. Uh, actually, this is uh, supported uh, even uh, by the data from uh, Most Lake, where uh, uh, marina whitefish were stocked as well, but all the individ individuals were stocked together with uh, uh, all the individuals of uh, pike. So these pike were already uh, habit habituated or uh, already used to another prey than uh, whitefish. And in this lake, uh, we have not reported any uh, uh, deep occurrence of uh, pike and uh, nor the uh, significant uh, population decreases of whitefish. So in this lake, uh, uh, the Coexistence is very, lay, very well. On the other hand, in the Meadowed Lake, the Marina whitefish population goes so, so. Uh, actually, there are all the years up to now, they are uh, reproducing. Uh, the numbers of uh, young of the years are quite high, but um, uh, we are reporting very few older individuals, very few. So, to sum it up, um, actually, unique ecosystems are being successfully realized uh, with respect to the fish communities or the fish communities that are highly valued both from the biological and socio-economic point of view, being a guard of long-term maintenance of high water quality by decelerating the eventual negatives connected with possible eutrophication, and all that by achievement of the EU Water Framework Directive requirements. What are the potential risks? Uh, there will be enormous pressure on use of uh, these systems for angling. Uh, because the fish stocks that have high proportions of piscivorous fish or salmonids are for them extremely attractive. What should be completely uh, 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 restricted Yes, stocking of carp. What is the um, most uh, common um, stocking activity in Czech Republic? These systems are um, uh, so unique that can that they can be for many uh, can be used for many other uh, like subsystems of these coregonet, salmonet or pistivorous uh, uh, fish stocks rather than uh, used for carp. The carp uh, will have very negative effect on the uh, ecosystem because it is digging uh, in, the, in the bottom, it is decreasing the water uh, quality directly and indirectly. Um, and I think that is all from me. So if there are questions, I'm open to answer it, answer them. Okay, I, I thank uh, Dr. Paterka for excellent speech about fish and there is time for question. I would have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so the, the fish also they need some spawning areas and so we here in, in, well, in western Germany next to Cologne we also have these mining sites that will create really huge and very deep lakes in, in the end and so it, what about uh, spawning habitats I, I, I think they need to be more shallow and uh, should they, they may be separated and, and how much is needed. Also, probably this has to be also considered while uh, yeah, creating these uh, lakes after mining. 
yeah, it was already mentioned here that, uh, for example, the Milada Lake is, uh, or its shape is not uh, very suitable for uh, both recreation and biota as well. Uh, in uh, the case of Most Lake and Menard Lake, it was done in much better way. But uh, all the, in all of these lakes, the reproduction of fish uh, takes place without any problems, any negatives, uh, even uh, uh, the corregonids that are, that are more, uh, or I would say, uh, they need very special uh, spawning uh, grounds like sandy bottoms. Uh, even uh, uh, such uh, spawning grounds uh, can be found in, in, the, in, the, in the lake by the, the fish. So actually, uh, in our case, in Czech Republic, the spawning of fish uh, goes without any negatives, irrespective of what, uh, what are the... Um, what is the share of uh, shallow and deep parts? What is the substrate uh, in the lakes? Because uh, in the very literal row, uh, zones, uh, mainly relatively big stones are used uh, as an uh, anti-wave uh, um, to, to, re to, re to reduce actually the, uh, the wave action. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the literal zones are well, overgrown with macrophytes. So all actually in these lakes, uh, uh, more substrate types are present than in our reservoirs, I would say. So yeah. I would maybe again add to that, that many of that features concerning, you know, the literal presence or the shape of the lake can be actually created during end of the mining operation and you know what the water level will be so in that level you can make you know some shallow parts more extensive just by you know digging a little bit more of overburden and it's really because your machines are already there and so on they do not require so much extra cost compared to you know future benefits basically yeah but, but yeah, our legs, so they, they will be rather deep. And so it's, they calculate it will take about 30 years for them to fill. And so they will probably, we need several uh, shallow water zones uh, during the filling uh, to, to maintain this level line. I, I yeah, still have still no idea can how, be, how they that can be That can be, because they have these terraces when they mine. So this can be still, I think, done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Actually, in, in, in the case when the uh, flooding of the lake is quite slow, then even the macrophytes can very well go with the water. So uh, there are really not uh, significant problems connected with this. So I guess if the fish will be present and even if uh, the uh, flooding will take tens of years, they will be able to reproduce during the flooding very well. Okay, some more question. Yeah, I have yes, one. Yes, sorry. Question. Okay, so go ahead, and then Michael after you. Okay, uh, I should uh, say that uh, this is the first lecture I have listened on mine pit lake limnology. Even though I am teaching my student, uh, I mean, this is a very good uh, case study, you know, uh, of the Czech Republic about the mine pit lake and uh, hydric reclamation. One aspect uh, that there is a key factor for productivity of this type of lake. This is one. Then, uh, when we read most of the literature, because I don't have so much of this idea, we talk of that uh, there is a camo limnium because this mine pit lake behaves like a meromictic lake because they have the two layers. One layer, what is known as after thermocline, they have the chemolimnion. And this chemolimnion is formed because of uh, high salinity and all these things that water doesn't mix because of that chemolimnion property, the high salinity. Now, one question is whether uh, this piece 
uh, have uh, any uh, kind of heavy metal because lake are sometimes like most lake I am getting like 75 meter deep, some lake are about 50 meter deep and preferable depth should be like we read in literature around 25 meter. So my just one concern whether there is an objection that this type of fish do have certain um, toxic metal or whether metal has been analyzed this type of fish from the health point of view. Okay, I will start uh, from the last question. So actually, uh, I'm not sure how it was in Most and Medard Lake, but in Milada Lake, we gave uh, different fish species for heavy metals uh, analysis, and all of them were positive except the one case. But uh, finally, it was found out there was some uh, mistake during the analysis. So there is no problem with heavy metals and regarding uh, fish. And there was a question regarding uh, uh, productivity. Uh, the productivity of the system of these systems uh, is low and should be low. If we, if we would like to maintain the systems for recreation, having very high water quality, then we have to uh, uh, have the productivity on very low uh, level. And uh, regarding uh, um, some meromixy. Uh, so, um, yeah, I have stopped sharing, but I'm going to share it again. Uh, and here is the example of uh, Medard Lake. And in this lake, there are three parts like here and the uh, central part and here, where there are the deepest parts of the lake. And in these uh, parts, there is the hemocline. So the most uh, deep parts are with unsuitable conditions, like a uh, uh, higher amount of uh, uh, of uh, salts and so on, but uh, it represents only a, a very uh, small area of the uh, lake and uh, even extremely small volume of the lake. So uh, uh, don't think about it like uh, the half of the bottom is not ac accessible uh, by the fish, for example. So it, it, these are uh, areas of the bottom in low uh, percentages, I would say. They also serve as a strap for nutrients, yeah? so they can help to keep water actually oligotrophic and suitable for this recreation purposes we are aiming for. So and they also have some advantages. And another question, both of you, that uh, the depth of the lake, is, is there any regulation from Czech Republic authority that uh, deepest point should not exceed. Like in India, we have 30 meter permissible. If you exceed more than 30 meter deep, uh, in, especially in the coal and other, they have a lots of question. You reduce the deep by secondary capacity or something, something. But is there any regulation in Czech Republic that what is the maximum allowable depth uh, for this uh, type of mine pit lake? I, I don't think so. Jan? There is maximum depth which is regulated or? Yeah, I don't I, think so. I don't think so. It's basically depending on the depth of the mine. It's a little bit less than depth of the mine because they felt partly backfill it by overburden to generate the bottom. Yeah. And to remove, the, they, what they basically try, they want to separate the coal seam from the water. Yeah to avoid this heavy metal problem you mentioned and other problems. So they basically use part of the overburden to generate the bottom, which makes it a little bit shallower than is, uh, uh, than is the pit. But uh, the deepest pit is over 100 meters. And as you see, some of these uh, are 75 meters. So 
Yeah. And some of the deepest ones are actually projected to be even deeper. Thank you, thank you. But it's an absolutely nice presentation from both of you. About okay, Michael, you have some question before. Yes, I still have a question. Uh, so also priority effects of fishes coming in might be important, as I understood. So I, it just came to my mind that here in, in, in our area, so we will use uh, water from, from a big river where we have invasive goby species. And so they prevented actually the, uh, uh, well, spawning and, and so of, of, of the native fish because they were eating up all, all the eggs and so on. And so when, <laughs> when, when the lakes are filled with, with this water, so we probably have to be careful um, preventing the invasion of these gobies. Uh, yes, uh, you are right. Gobies are extremely successful and uh, they can affect the other fish species in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, um, yeah, and, and the question uh, was? Uh, yeah, it's, it's just whether really there are priority effect, effects, you know, if, if you- Do you think maybe more pissivores like, can kind of help to eliminate them or you can choose some specific pissivor species to, you know, to battle them or? Hmm. Yeah, um, uh, actually the anglers were uh, not taken uh, um, for the uh, for the decision making uh, prior, the uh, the communities where the fish communities were selected for the specific uh, lakes, but uh, now we see that in future case we have to communicate uh, even this with the anglers because uh, the anglers union here in Czech Republic. Uh, they are really uh, powerful. They are, and what they really want is to use uh, the, uh, the post mining uh, lakes. So in future, maybe there will be even uh, discussions prior, there will be uh, uh, prior the fish community uh, will be uh, selected uh, or um, actually I would I would recommend uh, this because otherwise there are some very uh, socially complicated discussion yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Right. I, I understand yes thank you very much thank you okay some other question Yes, Marco. Hello. Um, I might have a few. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, both great presentations. Um, my first question is, are these accumulations usually used only uh, mostly for recreation and nature preservation purposes or uh, flood prevention is also one of them? Because I know in Czech Republic, there was something like land consolidation projects where they built enormous amount of micro accumulations for flood prevention everywhere. Uh, also, how does this affect uh, downstream biodiversity and, uh, and generally population of, of living organisms? Uh, my other one is um, about uh, preparing the soil for flooding is it just compacting i mean you mentioned geotextiles which are which are used there how often is that or do you put some sort of gravel layer on top of that or just compacted soil or geotextile meshes um, my third question is how do you measure fish population in those uh, kilograms per um, hectares or per meter cubic and i have Another one, mostly for Professor Froze, which is related to the this morning session, which is about uh, spontaneous combustion of coals and how does that affect uh, a forested or revegetated sites, whether it's reclamation or spontaneous succession, are, are they more prone to to forest fires or some other other fires due to spontaneous combustion of coals because I know that it's a thing, but I'm not sure how often it is. 
compared okay. to other places. So maybe I will start. If mm -hmm. you may. So, so basically concerning the, the spontaneous combustion of coal, this is something which is happening really inside the mine. And this is something which used to be happening in Czech Republic in 70s, 80s. And the reason for that actually was that that time there was pressure to maximize the coal production. And there was quite large area of coal seam, which was exposed at the same time. Now the legislation start to be very careful about that. So they basically have to expose only very narrow strip of coal seam. And this is constantly removed by mining. And whatever you know is left behind, for example, because it's not mineable, because uh, I don't know, whatever prison, you know, sulfur content or whatsoever, that has to be covered by overburden basically in a matter of days, yeah? Uh, this is even more critical in the Sokolov region because Sokolov region, they basically have problem with geothermal waters, which have huge biological potential. So to protect them, they have to cover the, 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 the ceiling, the bottom of the mine constantly by overburden, yeah? Okay, but basically there overburden, is, which might, might contain some coal in traces, cannot just yeah, spontaneously yeah, burst. Basically, and... basically, since then, we have no really coal seam fire. Actually, I worked there for 30 years, and I do not remember any extensive, uh, I mean, I, I cannot say no one, but not really extensive coal fire, yeah? And... Uh, so basically this, however, even if this has happened, this is isolated inside the mine and it's separated by quite a distance created by overburden, which typically do not burn. As concern uh, uh, flammability of post-mining forest, I will speak about that tomorrow, that, but that's basically relate in large extent to how much uh, uh, organic matter you have in overlying horizons, yeah? How much you have litter and fermentation layer which can eventually dry out and be potentially burnable. If you mix most of your organic matter into the mineral soil and it's bounded to aggregates, its burnability, it's reduced. So yeah. briefly, briefly to answer to that, I will elaborate that more tomorrow. Also, I'm guessing climatic condi conditions are yeah, different, like in yeah, Spain or this Italy. It's more likely to happen if you have dry climate and you also accumulate more litter if you have dry climate, so burnability increase. Concerning this bottom preparation, I just, uh, it's basically all what you mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, we have just three lakes already flooded and it's still very experimental approach each lake is different so basically sometimes they just put the clay over burden ceiling and they compact it sometimes they put geotextile it also depends on the slope of on inclination of the slope mm -hmm. and stuff like that yeah so but basically all the approaches which you mentioned are applied and i think that was all related to me yeah or there was something i should specifically answer mm, i think i think that yeah and then that there suffices was your point. biomass and the other was goes for dr Baderk, i guess mm. uh, yes the the main use of the lakes should be recreation both active and passive as active recreation here we understand uh, for example angling as well so recreation is the main use of the, uh, of the lakes. Then uh, how the lakes are affecting uh, the uh, uh, rivers below. Uh, actually, at the moment, the lakes are quite, I would say, sh short of water. So uh, more water rather coming in than out. So they do not affect uh, the rivers uh, that much. And I, I can use the example of Medard Lake because uh, there is the river Ohře. And the Medard Lake was flooded from river Ohře. Uh, 
at the very beginning, uh, we had um, more fish species, uh, riverine fish species uh, in the lake, but this number dropped to less than half, uh, maybe one, uh, one third in, in the lake, because the conditions in the lake are completely different from the river. And, but all of these uh, fish species uh, are the uh, species that are present uh, in the uh, river. So just theoretically, uh, the uh, fish species coming from the uh, lake are not able to anyhow significantly affect uh, uh, the river below, uh, the, the, below uh, the lake. What uh, came to my mind is that in the lake, we had some invasive uh, species reported, like uh, 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 Dreisena polymorpha uh, here in Czech Republic and some species of uh, macrophytes. So in this respect, uh, there can be some, uh, some negative, uh, negative uh, uh, effect. And yeah, how to calculate uh, the biomasses? I will use again the help of one of my slides. So uh, it was mentioned here, we combine both the hydroacoustics, uh, wait, the hydroacoustics, that is in detail seen here, and the gill nets. The uh, gill nets we place in all the depth layers in both pantic as well as uh, the pelagic habitats. From the hydroacoustics, we get the quantities of fish in uh, abundances per hectare and uh, kilograms per uh, hectare. And then the total fish community composition is estimated as average of catches in all the habitats weighed by volume of the particular habitat. So uh, the fish uh, composition that, is, uh, that comes from the kill nets, uh, we uh, uh, use to weigh, the, uh, and for the weighing, uh, we use the volume of the uh, habitats the fish were uh, catched. And, uh, uh, we combine it uh, together with the quantitative uh, estimates uh, that we get with uh, uh, from hydroacoustics. But in in order to get it for each depth, you basically use the data you get from the shore depth uh, zones. Uh, you you mean the like uh, pro proportions which are caught in in these side. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, the nets, we, yeah, we use proportions uh, of uh, species, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, the, the numbers and the weights we use from the hydroacoustics. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you very much. So that answered all of my questions. You're no very welcome. Wrong. Thank you. Okay, so there are some more questions. Okay, if not, uh, we are basically close to expected closure time. So, so we can close for today and we will meet today, uh, tomorrow again, 11 uh, a.m., which are uh, uh, lecture starting by Michael Bonkowski and then continuing by me. And tomorrow afternoon, the Bill Marqueta Henrichova who will be speaking for about landscape perspective, landscape perspective in uh, mining uh, reclamation. So how we how we organize that in landscape context. And the morning uh, lecture will be more about more detail about soil recovery because this is quite crucial for, for mining site recovery. So thank you for your attention so far and looking forward to meet you tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yo, uh, Christina, it was okay.
Uh, jo, a je to, takže to, to skončíš to nahrávání, máte tady uložený a zítra v 11. Jo? Ano, počítám s tím takhle, jenom bude za mě Jana zítra dopoledne, jo. Dobrý, já nemůžu, nevadí. já mám jo, nějaký zkusky. Dobrý, tak jo, když to budu volat Janě, kdyby něco. Jo, díky. Tak, ahoj. Ahoj.